At any time, we welcome everyone to today's hearing on the report of Special Counsel John Durham. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Alabama to lead us in the pledge. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Chair is recognized for an opening statement. Three years ago, in 11 months, July 24, 2019, Bob Mueller sat in this room, in that chair, and told this committee, no collusion, no conspiracy, no coordination between President Trump and Russia. None. What the Democrats say? We don't care. We're going to keep going after President Trump. In fact, they didn't even wait one day. The next day, the phone call between President Trump and President Zelensky became the basis for their impeachment. Republicans said maybe, maybe instead of the never-ending attacks on President Trump, maybe the country would be better off if we figured out how the whole false Trump-Russia narrative started. After two and a half years of the Mueller investigation, 19 lawyers, 40 agents, $30 million, where they found nothing, maybe, Maybe we should figure out how the whole lie started. And that's exactly what Mr. Durham has done. In his report, he told us how the dossier was funded. He told us who funded how eager the FBI was to use it, how they put the dossier in a FISA draft application just two days after receiving it. He told us that not one, not one single substantive allegation in the dossier was ever corroborated, ever validated, yet it was used, used to spy on an American citizen associated with the presidential campaign. He told us there was no proper predicate for opening the Crossfire Hurricane investigation, and maybe most importantly, he told us the FBI, the FBI, the preeminent law enforcement agency in the world, failed, failed in its fundamental mission of adherence to the rule of law. And unfortunately, I think once again, the Democrats will say, we don't care. It doesn't matter. We're never st gonna stop going after President Trump. In fact, eight days ago, we saw how far they are willing to go with the indictment of President Trump. But frankly, this shouldn't surprise us. They told us their objective. In fact, it was an agent on the case of Crossfire Hurricane who told us what their objective was. We all remember the text message from Peter Strzok where he said, don't worry, we'll stop Trump. It started with the Crossfire Hurricane investigation. Mr. Durham has told us how wrong that was. Now we have an indictment of a former president who's winning in every single poll by his opponent's Justice Department. And in between those two events, we had the Mueller investigation, we had impeachment, we had 51 former intel officials falsely falsely tell us the Biden laptop was Russian disinformation. We had a raid on President Trump's home. And of course, we got Alvin Bragg's ridiculous case in New York. Seven years, nothing has changed. Don't believe me? We interviewed Stephen D'Antuano, former head of the Washington field office when the Trump classified document case began. Mr. D'Antuano told the committee, we interviewed him just two weeks ago, two weeks ago today. Mr. D'Antuano told the committee that when he asked the Department of Justice, why is there new, no U.S. attorney assigned to the Trump classified document case? Headquarters said, because we're running it. He suggested the Miami field office should do the raid. Instead of sending the folks from Washington field office down to Miami, have the folks in, in the Miami field office do it. Headquarters said no. He suggested there shouldn't be a raid. Instead, they should continue to work with President Trump's lawyers. Once again, headquarters said no. Mr. D'Antuano even said, how about when we get there? When we arrive at President Trump's home, we then call his lawyer and we do the search together. Again, headquarters said no. Another interesting fact, the lawyer who turned down Mr. D'Antuano's request happens to be the same person who is alleged to have pressured the attorney representing a Trump employee about a judgeship. 
Nothing has changed, and frankly, they're never going to stop. Seven years of attacking Trump is scary enough, but what's more frightening, any one of us could be next. In fact, it's already started. Parents at school board meetings are terrorists. Pro-life Catholics are extremists. Even journalists aren't safe. Federal Trade Commission, 13 letters. One of those letters to Twitter said, who are the journalists you're talking to? Think about that. They named four people personally. Two come and testify in front of this committee. While they're in front of this committee, Democrats are asking them to reveal their sources, violate First Amendment principles. One of them, Matt Taibbi, while he's sitting at that table testifying to the Judiciary Committee, the IRS is knocking on his door. Parents, Catholics, journalists, but guess who gets it the worst? Guess who gets it the worst? Whistleblowers. If you dare come forward and tell Congress what's going on, look out. They will come for you. They will take your clearance. They will take your pay. They'll even take your kids' clothes. Just ask Garrett O'Boyle, who testified in front of this committee as well. Over the next few hours, we're going to hear the facts and details about the whole false Trump-Russia narrative, the crossfire hurricane investigation, and hopefully, hopefully it will help change things at the Department of Justice. But regardless of what the Biden administration and the Garland Justice Department do, I know what Republicans in the House are committed to doing. We will work to dramatically change the FISA law, and we will do everything we can in the appropriation process to stop the federal government from going after the American people. Now recognize the ranking member for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On June 8th, a grand jury in Miami indicted former President Trump on 37 counts related to his mishandling of extraordinarily sensitive national security information, including information regarding defense and weapons capabilities of both the United States and foreign countries, United States nuclear programs, potential vulnerabilities of the United States and its allies to military attack, and plans for possible retaliation in response to a foreign attack. According to the indictment, the unauthorized disclosure of these classified documents could put at risk the national security of the United States, foreign relations, the safety of the, of the United States military, and human sources, and the continued viability of sensitive intelligence collection methods. And indeed, the indictment goes on to describe how the former president made such unauthorized disclosures. Even if you believe, as Chairman Jordan claims, that President Trump has committed no crime, Surely we can agree that it is dangerous and profoundly irresponsible to have taken these documents from the White House and left them unsecured in Mar-a-Lago. Don't take just my word for it. Trump's Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper, said that the former president's handling of this information put U.S. service members' lives and our national security at risk. And Trump's hand-picked Attorney General, Bill Barr, with whom I agree on very little, hit the nail on the head when he described the former president's legal troubles as, quote, entirely of his own making. He had no right to these documents. The government tried for over a year, quietly and with respect, to get them back, and he jerked them around. When he faced a subpoena, he didn't raise any legal arguments. He engaged in a course of deceitful conduct that was a clear crime if those allegations are true, close quote. The former president could have at any time for months simply returned the documents and avoided prosecution. But House Republicans do not want to talk about any of that. They seem incapable of assigning any agency or responsibility to Donald Trump for problems that are Trump's and Trump's alone. Instead, Republicans have planned this hearing and constructed an entire false narrative around this work of special counsel Durham in an effort to distract from the former president's legal troubles and mislead the American public. To be clear, the Durham report is by itself a deeply flawed vessel. After four years, thousands of employee hours, and more than six and a half million dollars in taxpayer dollars, Special Dur Counsel Durham failed to uncover any wrongdoing that Justice Department Inspector General Horowitz had not already found in 2019. He brought just two cases to trial and lost them both 
Both defendants were acquitted in mere hours. The single conviction that Special Counsel Durham obtained involved a single charge of lying to the FBI, a case developed and handed to him by the Inspector General, and one resolved by a quick plea bargain. The report itself outlined some fairly glaring investigative missteps. The FBI apparently never even looked at a thumb drive of key evidence related to allegations of contact between the Trump campaign and the Russian government via a Russian cell phone. Nor, says the report, did the FBI ever examine questionable computer contacts between the Trump Organization and Alpha Bank, one of the largest banks in Russia. The report also fails to recommend a single remedial measure that the Justice Department or the FBI might take to address certain process-related concerns, largely because DOJ and FBI have already implemented the changes recommended by the Inspector General three and a half years ago. Now, I understand that, like the former president, many MAGA Republicans had a lot riding on the Durham investigation. I understand that they may, might be disappointed with where it landed, but that is no excuse for making things up. First, the Durham report unequivocally concludes that the FBI not only had the evidence to open an investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election, but actually had an affirmative obligation to investigate ties between the Russian government and the Trump campaign. It is simply not true, as some Republicans have claimed, that the Durham report suggests that there should not have been an investigation. Affirmative obligation. Those are Mr. Durham's words, not mine. Second, the Durham report shows that the FBI began its investigation when an aide to the Trump campaign disclosed in May 2016 that the campaign knew that Russia had thousands of emails that would embarrass Hillary Clinton. The aide bragged about it at a bar. An Australian diplomat who overheard the remark reported it, and the investigation began. It is simply not true, as the most extreme voices in this room have claimed, that the investigation was somehow launched by the Clinton campaign. That con particular conspiracy theory is off by several months. Nor is it true that the FBI was opposed to Trump from the beginning. For example, the Durham report tells us that the FBI encouraged a confidential human source to infiltrate the Clinton campaign, not the Trump campaign, and take steps to entrap, unsuccessfully, aides to Secretary Clinton. This story is right there on pages 74 and 75 of the report. I suspect we won't hear a word about it from House Republicans today because it does not fit the MAGA narrative. Finally, nothing in the Durham report disputes the central findings of Special Counsel Robert Mueller. Namely, Russia interfered in the 2016 election. It did so to help Donald Trump, and the Trump campaign welcomed this interference. This last point is important because it tells us how Mr. Durham became Special Counsel in the first place, and it goes to the heart of the fully false narrative of MAGA victimhood. From the day that Special Counsel Mueller began his work, Donald Trump and his political allies have railed against an imagined conspiracy against the former president. The Russia investigation was a setup. It was a witch hunt. Obama did it. We need to investigate the investigators. Then came the Mueller report. The Mueller report was delivered to Attorney General Barr on Friday, March 22, 2019. The next Monday, Mr. Durham was in Barr's office. A week later, a colleague emailed Mr. Durham to ask about, quote, the project that Durham and Barr were working on. While we on this committee were fighting to get access to the Mueller report, Mr. Durham was already working on an investigation to undercut its central findings. A few weeks later, the Trump administration announced Mr. Durham's investigation into the investigators. And by August 2019, Mr. Durham and Attorney General Barr were on a plane to Europe jointly hunting down non-existent evidence of Donald Trump's deep state conspiracy theories. If the duo ever found evidence proving that Donald Trump was right all along, that evidence certainly never made it into the Durham report. It has been alleged, however, that they found evidence implicating the former president in certain financial crimes during their trip. Incidentally, that information, too, is missing from Mr. Durham's final pages. When he could not give Donald Trump evidence of a deep state conspiracy, Mr. Durham gave him the next best thing, a public narrative with Hillary Clinton as the victim, villain. 
Over the ensuing years, Mr. Durham constructed a flimsy story built on shaky inferences and dog whistles to far-right conspiracy theorists. Although he lost both times, he took a case to trial. By prolonging his investigation, Durham was able to keep Donald Trump's talking points in the news long after Trump left office. With a loose approach to DOJ norms, protecting the reputation of the agency, and a cavalier disregard for the privacy and reputational rights of others, Mr. Durham's investigation operated as headline generator for MAGA Republicans. Less than half a year into his four-year investigation, Mr. Durham publicly disputed Inspector General Horowitz's conclusion that the FBI was warranted in opening a full investigation in violation of DOJ rules protecting investigations from appearances of political bias. Mr. Durham similarly flouted guidelines designed to protect third parties from reputational injury when he used his two indictments to accuse the Clinton campaign of a vast conspiracy to tie Trump to Russia. But at the end of the day, Mr. Durham never found what he was looking for. He cannot dispute a single conclusion in the Mueller report. He cannot prove a magnificent deep state conspiracy. And he cannot say that the FBI investigation into the Trump campaign's many ties to Russia never should have happened. And again, I can see why this would be disappointing to some. But instead of owning up to his failure, the Durham report doubles down on theories that lost spectacularly before two unanimous juries. The report also references classified material that has been called likely disinformation to lay out a series of accusations against the former president's perceived enemies. By presenting his so-called findings in this way, swiping a Republican boogeyman and hiding an inconvenient truth in footnotes, the Durham report gives Donald Trump one last talking point. It did not have to be this way. It may be hard to remember, but at the outset of the Durham investigation, Mr. Durham was a well-respected career prosecutor with a solid reputation. The Attorney General is supposed to appoint the special counsel to prevent the appearance of politicization in a criminal investigation. Mr. Durham could well have lived up to that expectation. Instead, what we got was a political exercise that operated with ethical ambiguity and existed to perpetuate Donald Trump's unfounded claims. The investigation failed in its political objectives, but did real damage to a department that is still recovering from the excesses of the Trump administration. And despite Mr. Durham's best efforts, a reckoning is well underway. Do not be misled. Former President Donald Trump is not a victim. He did this to himself. For all of its flaws, the Durham report does not show that anyone else is responsible for the president's legal woes, past, present, or future. Anyone who tells you otherwise is simply making it up. I thank the chairman, and I yield back. Without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. Today's witness is the Honorable John Durham. Mr. Durham was appointed as a special counsel in 2020 to investigate intelligence activities investigations arising out of the 2016 presidential campaigns. He is a career prosecutor, having served as a U.S. attorney for the District of Connecticut and in various other roles with that office since 1989. Prior to that, he served with the Department of Justice, the Boston Strike Force on Organized Crime, and in various state-level prosecutors' offices. We welcome our witness uh, and thank him for appearing today. We will begin by swearing you in. Would you please rise and raise your right hand, Mr. Durham? Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, so help you God? Let the record show that the witness has answered in the affirmative. Thank you. You may, you may be seated. Please know that your written testimony will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, we ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes, but we'll give you a little extra time if you need it. Mr. Durham, you may begin. Hit your mic there, Mr. Durham, and just, just keep it on if you can throughout the, throughout the day. Oh, is it on? Yep, it's on now. Thank you. Again, uh, good morning, um, <coughs> Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Nadler, and members of uh, this committee. As the committee knows, on May 13th, 2019, Attorney General Barr directed me to conduct a preliminary review into certain matters related to federal investigations concerning the 2016 presidential election campaigns. That review subsequently um, developed into several criminal investigations and gave rise to my subsequent appointment as special counsel in these matters. 
Many of the most significant issues documented in the report that we have written, including those relating to lack of investigative uh, discipline, failure to take logistical, logical investigative steps, and bias are re uh, relevant to important national security interests that this committee and the American people are concerned about. If repeated and left unaddressed, these issues could result in significant national security risks and further erode the public's faith and confidence in our justice system. As we said in the report, um, our findings were sobering. I can tell you, having spent 40 years plus as a federal prosecutor, they were particularly sobering to me. A number of my colleagues who uh, spent decades in the FBI themselves, they were sobering. While I'm encouraged by some of the reforms that have been implemented by the FBI, the problems identified in this report, anybody who actually reads the report and the details of the report, the documented portions of the report, I think would, uh, would find that um, the problems identified in the report are not susceptible to overnight fixes. As we said in the report, they cannot be addressed solely by enhancing training or additional policy requirements. Rather, what is required is accountability, both in terms of the standards to which our law enforcement personnel uh, hold themselves and in the consequences they face for violation of laws and policies of relevance. I'm here to answer your questions. I appreciate the opportunity to. I'll answer them to the best of my ability, and I hope to be of service to your oversight function. As I'm sure you know, the Department of Justice um, has issued some guidelines as to what I'm authorized to discuss and those things that I am not authorized to discuss. In this regard, uh, accordingly, I'll refer principally to the report. I do want to emphasize a few points at the outset, however. First, I want to emphasize in the strongest terms possible that my colleagues and I carried out our work in good faith, with integrity and in the spirit of following the facts wherever they lead without fear uh, or favor. At no time and in no sense did we act with a purpose to further partisan or political ends to the extent that somebody suggests otherwise that's simply untrue and offensive. Second, the findings set forth in this report are serious and deserve attention from the American public and its representatives. Let me just briefly highlight a few of those. For one, we found troubling violations of law and policy in the conduct of highly consequential investigations directed at members of a presidential campaign and ultimately a presidential administration. To me, it matters not whether it was a Republican campaign or a Democrat campaign. It was a presidential campaign. Our team comprised dedicated and experienced prosecutors and law enforcement agents who worked day in and day out through the entire um, COVID epidemic in the office trying to interview people, all in an effort to try to get to those facts and the Around truth. Uh, that such a group of people made these findings, experienced FBI agents, experienced prosecutors, not people by and large from Washington, but from other parts of the country. The fact that these people made these findings, as reflected in the report, um, is of concern um, and should be of concern to any American who cares about our civil liberties, the rule of law, and the just and proportionate application of the law to all of us, whether we're friends or we're foes, the law ought to apply to everybody in the same way. During our investigation, we charged a former FBI agent who pleaded guilty to the felony offense of altering and fabricating a portion of a document used to obtain a court order, a FISA order, of a surveillance of a United States citizen, which in our view is a significant problem. Several of the relevant FISA applications at issue um, in the Crossfire investigation omitted references to what was clearly relevant and highly exculpatory information that should have been disclosed to the FISA court. Multiple FBI personnel who signed or assisted in preparing renewal applications for that same FISA warrant acknowledged that they did not believe that the target, Mr. Page, was a threat to national security, much less a knowing agent of a foreign power, which is what the law requires. It appears from our investigation that the FBI leadership dismissed those concerns. Another aspect of our findings concerned the FBI's failure to sufficiently scrutinize information it received 
or to apply the same standards to allegations it received about the Clinton and Trump campaigns. As our report details, the FBI was uh, too willing to accept and use politically funded and uncorroborated uh, opposition research, such as the Steele dossier. The FBI relied on the dossier and FISA applications, knowing that it was uh, likely um, material originating from a political campaign, a political opponent. It did so even after the President of the United States, the FBI and CIA directors and others received briefings about intelligence suggesting that there was a Clinton campaign plan underway to stir up a scandal tying Trump to Russia. The accuracy of the intelligence was uncertain at the time, but the FBI failed to analyze or even assess the implications of the intelligence in any meaningful way. When the FBI learned that the primary source of information for the Steele dossier, which was basically the guts of the narrative about there being a well um, uh, coordinate conspiracy involving Trump and the Russians. When they learned that uh, Danchenko was the um, uh, primary subsource uh, for those reports, it was at a time when the FBI already knew that Danchenko himself had previously been the suspect of an FBI espionage investigation. He was suspected of being a Russian asset. Um, and nonetheless, they signed him up as a paid informant without further investigation of that espionage concern to say nothing of resolving that espionage matter before using Denchenko and Denchenko's information. And when the FBI and Special Agent Mueller's office learned that Steele's primary subsource likely had gathered important portions of the dossier information uh, during travels to Russia with uh, one Charles Dolan, it inexplicably decided not to interview Dolan uh, or investigate his activities. Finally, I would like to add that although our work exposed uh, deep concerns um, concerning facts about the conduct of these investigations, our report should not be read to suggest in any way that Russian election interference was not a significant threat. It was. <laughs> Nor should it be read to suggest that the investigation, um, the investigative authorities at issue uh, are no longer serve important law enforcement and national security interests. They do. Rather, responsibility for the failures and transgressions that occurred here rest with the people who committed them or allowed them to occur. Again, to my mind, the issues raised in the report deserve close attention from the American people and their elected representatives here in Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Durham. Uh, the, we will now proceed under the five-minute uh, rule for questions. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Durham, for being here today. This is much anticipated. We have lots of questions for you. I'll try to set the table here at the outset uh, from 20,000 feet. The American people rely on the FBI to abide by its guiding principles, and you know what those are, fidelity, bravery, and integrity. And we rely upon them to uphold the Constitution and protect the American people. Americans deserve and expect from our premier law enforcement agency to apply justice blindly, and that is without political bias or ulterior motives. However, your report now famously states, and here's the big quote, based on the review of Crossfire Hurricane and related intelligence activities, you concluded that the DOJ and FBI failed to uphold their important mission of strict fidelity to the law. There's no, way that, another, no other way to put this. The report illustrates egregious actions on behalf of the FBI that have further eroded faith in our institutions. Ms. Durham, in your report, and again here today, you said that your findings and conclusions are sobering. Could you unpack a little bit more what that means? Why do you say sobering? Well, let me, let me um, give you some uh, real life um, views on that. I have had um, any number of FBI agents um, who I've worked with over the years, some have retired, some are still in place, who have come to me and apologized for the manner in which uh, that investigation was undertaken. I take that seriously. These are good, hardworking, the majority of people in the FBI decent human beings who swear to, uh, under their oaths to uh, abide by the law and, and the like. And uh, I think that, that um, typifies, exemplifies of, uh, the, of the concern here. Um, there, is, uh, there are investigative activities undertaken or not undertaken here, uh, which raise real concerns about whether or not the law was followed, the policies in place, the FBI were followed. 
Um, you wrote in your report, quote, based on the evidence gathered in the multiple exhaustive and costly federal investigations of these matters, including the instant investigation, neither U.S. law enforcement nor the intelligence community appears to have possessed any actual evidence of collusion in their holdings at the commencement of the crossfire investigation. To date, has any evidence of collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia ever been uncovered? I mean, there is, there is information, obviously, in the um, report that was prepared by Director Mueller uh, and whatnot. But as uh, to collusion or conspiracy, I'm not aware of any. And, and, when, and, and let me stop you. When the FBI opened Crossfire Hurricane, that's the issue at hand, it did not have any information that anyone in the Trump campaign had ever been in contact with Russian intelligence officials. Isn't that right? As we wrote in, as we wrote in the, um, uh, the report, talked to the director of the CIA, the deputy director of the CIA, the director of NSA, um, uh, and people within the uh, FBI, and there was no such information that they had in their holdings at the time they opened Crossfire Hurricane. And, and you uh, detail, I'm going to go quickly here, I run out of time, you, you, and you're, you detail how FBI personnel working on FISA applications uh, violated protocols, they were cavalier at best, as you said in your own words, towards accuracy and completeness. Um, senior FBI personnel displayed a serious lack of analytical rigor uh, towards information that they received, especially information received from politically affiliated persons or entities. And you said, quote, a significant reliance on investigative leads provided or funded by Trump's political opponents were relied upon here. Among the most alarm alarming things that you referred to in the report is the impact of confirmation bias. And you said in your report at page 303, that's defined as, or it stands for, the general proposition that there is a common human tendency, mostly unintentional, for people to accept information and evidence that is consistent with what they believe to be true. But sir, here, this wasn't innocent, unintentional, unintentional human tendency, was it? It was overt political bias, was it not? Peter Strzok, for example. There are uh, some in individuals uh, who clearly expressed um, a personal bias. Um, it's difficult to get into somebody else's head to see whether they knew it. Unless we have their emails, right? And he had, and Peter Strzok, for example, pronounced host he had pronounced hostile feelings towards President Trump. Everybody knows that. Everybody in the country knows it. So he was in charge of this. He was the dire dire deputy assistant director of counterintelligence, officially opened the investigation at the direction of FBI, deputy FBI director Andrew McCabe. He said horrible things about President Trump and all of his supporters, by the way. How could we say he did not have political bias? Yeah, I know that uh, it clearly re reflects a personal bias th that he had. I'll leave it to others and the facts that are set out in the, um, in the reports, whether that's political bias, personal bias, but there's clearly bias. What we know now is the FBI and the DOJ have been turned into activated political weapons against citizens and even a former president because of their of opposing viewpoints, sir. Um, they failed to follow protocols in 2016, and you've suggested new protocols may somehow be affixed to this. How can the American people have confidence that if they didn't follow, follow protocols in 2016 that they will new protocols? And I think that's why um, I said that in the opening remarks, you know, this is not an easy fix. I mean, it's going to take time uh, to rebuild the public's confidence in the institution. The changes of the forms they have made are certainly changes that are going to guard, to some extent, against the repeat of what happened in Crossfire Hurricane. I'm out of time. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Mr. Durham. Can you pull that microphone real close so everyone gets sure. can, can hear what you say? I, we, we appreciate that. Gentleman from New York is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Durham, your report reads like a defense of the Trump campaign and an attack on Hillary Clinton because that's exactly what it is. Donald Trump wanted you to investigate the investigators to show the deep state conspiracy but you never found one. Instead, you gave him and his MAGA Republicans the next best thing, someone else to blame for Donald Trump's problems. That's why you're here today, because the chairman and his colleagues need someone, anyone, to deflect from the mounting evidence of Trump's misconduct. Let me remind you that Donald Trump was federally indicted on 37 counts for mishandling classified information, 37 counts. That's why you're here today, not because of anything that happened in 2016. Ms. Durham, your investigation cost more than six and a half million dollars, involved the work of dozens of FBI employees and federal prosecutors, some of whom resigned in protest and took roughly four years to complete. Is that correct? No. It's not correct. No, I mean, there were multiple did, parts of that. Did it take four years to complete? Correct. Okay. And with all these resources and all these people you, you were sent to help you investigate the investigators, you only filed three criminal cases. You only brought two cases to trial, correct? Correct. And you lost all the cases you brought to trial, correct? Correct. 
In fact, two juries acquitted your defendants in all charges. And the one conviction that you obtained, the defendant pleaded guilty to a single count that never went to trial, correct? Correct. I will note that in that case, the primary investigative steps were all completed by Inspector General Horowitz. Perhaps you were better when it came to your report. From my reading, your report did not make any specific concrete recommendations to improve DOJ or FBI policies or procedures. In fact, your report repeatedly references the recommendations made by Inspector General Horowitz, almost all of which DOJ and FBI have already implemented. Again, your investigation lasted four years. Four years in untold sums of money, and you still obtained only one conviction. You did produce a 300-page report, though, and that's given my Republican counterparts plenty of material to spin. Mr. Durham, George Papadopoulos was a foreign policy advisor to the Trump campaign in spring 2016. Isn't that right? Correct. And in May 2016, he told an Australian diplomat that the Trump team had received some kind of suggestion from Russia that it could assist this process with the anonymous release of information during the campaign that would be damaging to Secretary Clinton. This is a fact that came out during the Mueller investigation, and your investigation found nothing to dispute this fact, correct? There's more detail to that in the report. Did it find anything to dispute this report, to dispute this fact? No. Okay. On page 50 of your report, you, report that you, you wrote that on July 28, 2016, FBI headquarters received the Australian information that formed the basis for the opening of Crossfire Hurricane, correct? Correct. So this fantasy that some MAGA Republicans have created where the investigation was started for any reason other than a Trump campaign operative bragging to Australian intelligence assets about Russian dirt that would damage Hillary Clinton is not true. And when the FBI received that information, according to your report, it had not just the predication to investigate, there is no question, you wrote, that the FBI had an affirmative obligation to closely examine the Australian information. Isn't that right? The FBI had an obligation to examine and That's correct. So the origin of the investigation was not the Steele dossier. It was not Alpha Bank. It was a Trump aide's loose lips about his campaign's advanced view into a hack that had a profound effect on the 2016 election. That information supplied by the Australian government gave the FBI predication to begin an investigation. And I'd like to discuss one more false inclusion about your report that's made its way into the MAGA Republican talking points. Some of my colleagues across the aisle have started calling this the, quote, Russia hoax. It's the theory that Russia did not actually interfere in the 2016 presidential election. That is patently false. In 2017, during the Trump administration, the Director of National Intelligence declassified a report on Russian activity in the 2016 election. You're aware of this report, correct? Correct. And in this report, the intelligence community found that, quote, Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered an influence campaign in 2016 aimed at the U.S. presidential election. Russia's goals were to undermine public faith in the U.S. democratic process, denigrate Secretary Clinton, and harm her electability and potential presidency. We further assess Putin and the Russian government developed a clear preference for President-elect Trump, close quote. You did not dispute that Trump ordered an influence campaign to influence the 2016 election in your report, did you? As I said, there no. was a real yes Russian no? threat. No, okay. Special Counsel Mueller indicted 12 Russian intelligence officers in July 2018, isn't that right? Correct. The 12 intelligence officers were indicted for attacking the Clinton campaign. On page 55 of your report, you acknowledge that at a press conference in 2016, Donald Trump on camera said, Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. Is that correct? That's correct. And two years later, at the Helsinki Summit, Trump told the press that he believed Russian President Putin over his own intelligence officials when he told them Russia did not interfere during the 2016 elections. Uh, season. I see my time has expired. I yield back. Gentlemen, can, the witness can respond if he chooses to. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Fry, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are here today to provide transparency, finally, to the American people. Seven years ago, the FBI launched Crossfire Hurricane, the left's brazen attempt to keep Donald Trump out of the White House. This federal investigation, funded by the Hillary Clinton campaign, caused Americans to believe that then-candidate Trump was colluding with Russia in order to win the 2016 presidential election. Mr. Durham has spent four years investigating this, 
480 witnesses, 6 million pages of documents, 190 subpoenas, and executing seven search warrants. Less than a month ago, he completed this report um, that sh it, it instigated a baseless investigation and launched a partisan attack on President Trump, despite having no true justification to do this. That was the FBI. Within three days of receiving the information from a diplomat in Australia, the FBI opened a full-fledged investigation into the Trump campaign. So, Mr. Durham, let's get into this. The FBI opened up Crossfire Hurricane without speaking to the people who provided the initial information. Is that true? That's correct. The FBI opened Crossfire Hurricane on a Sunday, only three days after reviewing that information. Is that correct? That's correct. So just think about that for a moment. An investigation, a full investigation into a presidential campaign over a weekend. Mr. Durham, the FBI opened Crossfire Hurricane without interviewing any of the essential witnesses. Is that true? That's true. And the FBI also opened up Crossfire Hurricane without using any of the standard analytical tools typically employed to evaluate that evidence. Is that true? That's true. So think about that. The FBI never talked to the people who gave them the intelligence information. They never examined their own witnesses. They never interviewed the witnesses. They never corroborated the dossier. Mr. Durham, if the FBI had done these things, if they had done their homework, would it have found that its own Russian experts had no information about President Trump being involved with Russian leadership or Russian intelligence officials? Yes. So then, was there adequate predication for the FBI to open Crossfire Hurricane as a full investigation? On July 31st, in my view, based on our investigation, there was not a legitimate basis to open as a full um, investigation. Um, an assessment is something that had to be looked at, to gather information, such as interviewing the people who provided um, the uh, Papadopoulos information, checking their own databases, the databases of other intelligence agencies, and the standard kinds of things that you would do in an investigation like this. Mr. Durham, I think it's safe to conclude, based on that report and anyone who has read it, that they did not have that adequate basis, as you talked about, to, to launch this investigation. Let's move on to a, a second really troubling aspect of, of your findings. From the report, I gathered that key FBI leaders, all the way at the top, were predisposed to go after candidate Trump. This bias likely affected the conduct of FBI personnel in this investigation. Is that true? Yes. Can you describe that for a moment? How did confirmation bias play into this? Confirmation bias, as uh, was alluded to, uh, has to do with our uh, human tendency to um, accept things that we already think are true and to reject anything else. In this instance, there are any number of significant red flags <clears throat> that were raised that were simply ignored. If there's evidence that was inconsistent with the narrative, um, they didn't pay attention to it. They didn't explore it. They didn't take the logical investigative steps that should have been taken. Let's see how real this bias was. FBI, FBI Deputy Assistant Director Peter Strzok drafted and approved the Crossfire Hurricane opening communication. Is that correct? That's correct. And in your investigation, your office discovered text messages between Strzok and Lisa Page, who was the Special Assistant to the FBI Director McCabe, expressing strong bias against candidate Trump. That's true. For the record, let me read aloud. This, this was generated by, by staff, but this would, would, would look their, like their text messages. On August 18, 2016, Page texted Strzok, Trump's not going to become president, right? Right? And Strzok responded by saying, no, no, he's not. We'll stop it. It's clear that there was no evidence of Russia collusion with the Trump campaign in 2016. The American people deserve the truth. And I'm proud to serve on this committee to uncover these, these lies that were perpetuated for far too long. With that, Mr. Chairman, with my remaining 30 seconds, I will yield to you. I appreciate the uh, Chairman yielding back. We'll, we'll, uh, I'll, we'll wait for my time. We'll now recognize the gentlelady from uh, California. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Durham, for being here uh, this morning. Uh, the ranking member uh, explored uh, an item that I wanted to explore with you, which is based on the uh, information provided to the U.S. government by Australia that a campaign uh, aide had told one of their diplomats that the Russians had dirt on Clinton in the form of thousands of emails that, and this is a quote from your report, as an initial matter, there's no question the FBI had an affirmative obligation to closely examine the Australian information. So that's in your report. And 
I think the issue might be preliminary versus full because you agree that there was an obligation to look at it based on that. Is that correct? That's what you say. Well, you say report. based on that, uh, some of the premises of the question are inaccurate. Uh, Papadopoulos did not tell. The, uh, no, uh, the question is, do you disavow what you said in your report? That you had an affirmative obligation, the FBI, to look at that? The answer to that question, but they had to look at it, yes. All right. I want to take a look at some of the other things uh, that I didn't find in your report. In looking at the FBI's behavior, uh, did you find any uh, evidence that the FBI was uh, taking a, a look at the, at the hacking of the Democratic National Committee and their investigation of that? And if so, where is that in your report? That was outside the scope of what I was asked to do. And, and in the Mueller report, we found, he found, that the campaign manager, Mr. Manafort, was giving inside information, private polling data to the Russians, uh, that there was a meeting in Trump Tower with the president's son-in-law and his son, uh, where the Russians had promised they had dirt, and the email from the president's son was something to the effect, if so, we love it. Did the FBI look at that? Did you examine that? And if so, where is that in your report? That is not something I was asked to look at, and we didn't look at that. I'm wondering, did you take a look at how the FBI evaluated um, the alleged ties to Alpha Bank? Did you hire uh, cyber experts to actually take a look at those potential or alleged ties? Yes. Well, I didn't hire them. They were FBI experts. And where is that in your report? Um, I can't. Uh, it's in there. I can find the page. My, my colleagues can find the page, but it is a entire section on Alpha Bank, um, the white papers and the data that were provided by Mr. Sussman to the FBI, and then the subsequent No, no, but my question was, did you take a look, did, did you hire experts to evaluate the FBI's evaluation? I did not hire okay. experts to let me ask a what the experts said, no. Let me ask another question. You, I thought it was a, down a rabbit's hole, but uh, you and Attorney General Barr went to Italy to take a look at some allegation about foreign servers, and, and Italian officials gave you evidence that they said linked Donald Trump to certain financial crimes. Did the Attorney General ask you to investigate that matter that the Italians referred to you? And, and if so, did you take any investigative steps and did you file charges or if not, did you file a declination memo for decision not to charge in this case? The uh, question is outside the scope of what I think I'm authorized to talk about. It's not part of the report. I can tell you this, that investigative steps were taken, grand jury subpoenas were issued and it came to nothing. Uh, I'd like to yield the balance of my time to my colleague from California, Mr. Schiff. Mr. Term, uh, DOJ policy provides that you don't speak about a pending investigation, uh, and yet you did, didn't you? Um, I'm not exactly sure what when, you're When to. the Inspector General issued a report saying that the investigation was properly predicated, you spoke out in violation of Department of Justice, Department of Justice policy, to criticize the Inspector General's conclusions, didn't you? I issued a public statement. I didn't do it anonymously. I didn't do it through third persons. There were but nonetheless, you violated department policy by issuing a statement while your investigation was ongoing, didn't you? I don't know that. If I did, then I did, but I was not aware that I was violating some policy. Uh, and you also sought to get the inspector general to um, change his conclusion, did you not? When he was concluding that the investigation was properly predicated, did you privately seek to intervene to change that conclusion? This is outside the scope of the report, but if you want to go there, we asked the uh, Inspector General to take a look at the intelligence that's included in the classified appendix that you looked at and um, said that that ought to affect um, portions of his report. And, and you thought it was appropriate for you to intervene with an independent investigation by the Inspector General because he was reaching a conclusion you disagreed with. You thought that was appropriate. That's not, um, uh, the premise um, isn't right. The Inspector General um, circulated a draft memo to a number of um, agencies and persons. Our group was one of them. 
we were asked to review that draft and bring to his attention any concerns that we had or disagreements. And when he refused to change his report, you violated Mr. Chairman, the Mr. Chairman, I policy. insist on regular order. Well, it's not even his time. It's, it's Ms. Lofgren's time. So the gentleman yields back to Ms. Lofgren, who's not here, so the time has expired. Uh, Mr. Durham, in the summer of 2016, did our government receive intelligence that suggested Secretary Clinton had approved a plan to tie President Trump to Russia? Yes. Was that intelligence important enough for Director Brennan to go brief the President of the United States, the Vice President of the United States, the Attorney General of the United States, and the Director of the FBI? Yes. And was that intelligence put then into a memorandum, a referral memorandum? Yes. And was that memorandum then given to Director Comey and Agent Strzok? That's who it was addressed to, yes. Did Director Comey share that memorandum with the FISA court? I'm, I'm sorry, can you? Did he share that memorandum with the FISA court? Did Director Comey do that? I'm not aware of that if he did. Did he share it with the, with the lawyers preparing the FISA application? Not to my knowledge. Did he share it with the agents on the case working the Crossfire Hurricane case? No. Didn't share it with the agents on the case. Can you tell the committee what happened when you took that referral memo and shared it with one of those agents, specifically Supervisory Special Agent Number One? We interviewed the uh, first supervisor of the um, Crossfire uh, investigation. Um, the operational person. Uh, we showed him the intelligence um, information. Uh, he indicated he had never seen it before. Uh, he immediately became uh, emotional, uh, got up and left the room with his lawyer, um, spent some time in the hallway, came back. Um, he was ticked off, wasn't he? Yes. He was ticked off because this is something he should have had as an agent on the case. It's important information that the director of the FBI kept from the people doing the investigation. The information was kept from him. Who's Charles Dolan? Charles Dolan uh, is a public uh, relations person here in uh, Washington, D.C. He had uh, prior involvement, professional involvement, with the uh, Russian government, representing Russian government interests. Uh, he was a person that was associated with Igor uh, Danchenko. Um, he was also buddies with the Clintons, wasn't he? Uh, he had um, held positions um, when uh, President Clinton was president. And their campaign advisory to Secretary Clinton's presidential campaign, executive director of the Democrat Governors Association, that's the same Charles Dolan we're talking about? Uh, yes. Yeah. And wasn't he also a key source for information in the dossier? He provided some information that was included in Ritz the dossier, Ritz-Carlton yes. stuff, the Manafort stuff. In the Crossfire Hurricane investigation and the Mueller investigation, when the FBI interviewed Mr. Dolan, what did he have to say? Um, to my knowledge, they didn't interview Mr. Dolan. They didn't interview this guy? Source for the dossier? Key information in the dossier? Buddies with the Clintons and they didn't talk to him? No. I mean, we report on that because um, even Christopher Steele in October 2016 identified Dolan as somebody that might have information. The I find it interesting they didn't talk to him. What, there were, were there agents on the case who wanted to talk to Mr. Dolan, Mr. Durham? Yes. What happened to analyst number one? She kept pushing to talk to Mr. Dolan. She was ultimately turned down. What happened to her the day that she was turned down and said, no, no, you're, we're not talking to Dolan? What happened to her? Um, at about the same time, she was assigned to a different project. They moved her. They said, we can't have this. We can't have that. We can't be looking into the Clinton's buddy, a key source for the dossier. They reassigned her. And then what did she do? She memorialized it. She entered a memo to the file because she said, at some point, the inspector general is going to want to know this information. I'm going to make it sure it's recorded contemporaneously. She put it in the file. That's, I mean, it's crazy. They didn't talk to the, the, to the key source. They kept key intelligence from the, the investigators. This is how bad this investigation was. But here's the scary part. I don't think anything has changed. The day your report came out, five weeks ago, May 15th, you got a letter, Mr. Durham, addressed to you from the general counsel at the FBI, Mr. Jason Jones, writes you this six-page letter, and he says, not to worry, everything is fine. It's all been worked out at the FBI. He even says on page two, he says, had the reforms implemented by current FBI leadership, summarized below, been in place in 2016, failures detailed in your report never would have happened. And he underlines it. He said, this would never happen because of the reforms we implemented in 2019 and 2020. And then he says on page four, one of the specific reforms, he says, FBI executive management has instructed investigations should be run out of the field and not from the headquarters. That statement is not true. Five weeks ago, the FBI wrote you and said everything has changed when in fact it hasn't, and a statement in there is absolutely false, and we know it's false 
because two weeks ago today, we interviewed Stephen D'Antuano, former head of the Washington field office, Mr. Durham, and here's what he said in his transcript. Head of the Washington field office, when the Trump classified document investigation began, he said, that case was handled differently than I would have expected it to be than any other cases handled. We learned a lot of stuff from Crossfire Hurricane that headquarters should not work the investigation. It's supposed to be the field offices. My concern is that the Department of Justice was not following these principles. Nothing is, and that's the thing that scares me the most. Nothing has changed. Mr. Durham, I'm just finished with this. 60% of Americans now believe there's a double standard at the Justice Department. You know why they believe that? Because there is. That has got to change. And I don't think more training, more rules is going to do it. I think we have to fundamentally change the FISA process, and we have to use the appropriations process to limit how American tax dollars are spent at the Department of Justice. I yield back. General lady from Texas is recognized, Ms. Jackson Lee. Good morning. Good morning. You uh, value the independence of a special counsel, do you not? I do. In a letter to Attorney General Garland submitting your report, you asked him to allow you to continue investigation unencumbered. You said, we want to thank you and your office for permitting our inquiry to proceed independently without interference as you assured the members of the Judiciary Committee would be the case during your confirmation hearings to become Attorney General of the United States. You value your special counsel status. So it is accurate that Attorney General Garland let you proceed on your case as you wish. Is that true? That's true. And uh, yes or no, it was important to you that as a special counsel, your investigation was supposed to be independent. Is that correct? That's correct. Because special counsels and special attorneys are supposed to be independent, right? Special counsels. Yes. And independent. They're supposed to be independent. Is that correct? Special counsel is independent of the Attorney General's that, office. Thank you. Why is that the case in your view? Um, so there can be some confidence on the part of people looking at the investigation that was done, decisions uh, which were made. Thank you. It, special counsels and special attorneys are supposed to be, for the American public, to present the potential of a conflict of interest between the government and a sensitive investigation. By appointing a special counsel and attorney general, is supposed to be finding an unbiased party to do the investigating. This was at a very high level. This was dealing with potential presidential candidates. This was dealing with Russia collusion and undermining the very fabric of the United States of America. And they are supposed to leave that person alone, as you commended Attorney General Garland for doing. So unlike Attorney General Garland, Attorney General Barr was very involved in your investigation, wasn't he? He was not involved as a, when I became a special counsel. Prior to that, uh, I worked under the supervision of the Attorney General and Deputy He was very General's involved, office. was he not? Let me just bring you to this point. Barr established early on that he was very interested in your investigation. On June 8, 2018, he sent then Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein an unsolicited memo arguing that the Mueller investigation should not be able to force the president to submit to interrogation about obstruction. In his text message sending the memo, Barr wrote, that he feels very deeply about some of the issues taking shape in a Mueller matter. How often did you meet with Attorney General Barr in 2019? Uh, before I was special counsel, um, um, maybe, well, with him himself, you know, maybe every two weeks, three weeks, uh, something of that sort. And then after? And sometimes more frequently. And then after? After it became, uh, I had been appointed special counsel, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure that I saw him, but I didn't meet with him on a lot. investigation. No, right. it was not a lot. How often did you speak or text with the attorney general? This is during the investigation. I wouldn't. During the, when I was special counsel or prior to that? Special counsel, sir. Um, I don't know how many times I texted with him. Right. Well, according to now public records, Barr scheduled at least 18 meetings or calls with you between 2019 March and October 2019, and you and he text messages with each other frequently, didn't you? Text messages. Yeah, I was appointed as special counsel in October, so before that, yeah, there were probably any number of uh, text messages. After that, I don't, I don't know. Here are some examples. On August 31, 2019, he sent you a message that said, John strongly suggests that you a lot of interesting things. On February 6, 2020, you text him, sir, just emerging from a skiff. Are you open to a call earlier this morning? On February 14, 2020, 
Barr texts you, call me when you get a chance. On March 19, 2020, Barr texts, can I call you later? And you responded, most certainly. On March 27, 2020, you sent him the best phone number for you all during the time of being special counsel. And here's an interesting one. On September 24, 2019, the day that the Speaker Pelosi announced a formal impeachment inquiry into President Trump, Attorney General Barr texts you, call me a ASAP, and later that day you text back. Do you have a minute for a quick call, Durham? What was the purpose of this call, Mr. Durham? Were you discussing the impeachment inquiry? I never had any conversation with Attorney General Barr about the impeachment inquiry. Mr. Durham, this is an awful lot of direct interactions with the Attorney General for imposed supposedly independent counsel prosecutor. During these messages uh, that sound to you like appropriate interactions, do they sound like appropriate interactions between an Attorney General and a prosecutor investigating uh, the administration? Sure. Before uh, I was appointed special counsel, I worked for the Attorney General of the United States. Um, that's who But you subsequently me. became special counsel. I know that. Right. You subsequently became. Not only did you interact with the Attorney General frequently, you also regularly engaged with one of his top deputies, Seth Ducharm. What was your relationship with Mr. Ducharm? Seth Ducharm had been order. an assistant United States attorney in the Eastern District of New York. He works with one of my sons, who are friends, and he, uh, at the time, was working in the Office of the Attorney General. It seems that rather than having time, time an in the independent investigation, time there was a lot of interaction between the Attorney the General and the Special Prosecutor, well, I've, I've which been, shows been that generous with the, time the Attorney General so, was actively directing your work. General lady yield yields, the General Lady yields back. I think this is amazing, Mr. Durham. You had eight text messages with the Attorney General of the United States in 11 months' time period. That's, that's, that's amazing. I, think, I can't believe that. Mr. Chairman, parliamentary inquiry. Whose, whose time is that that you were speaking of? That was that time that was yielded to me earlier that I yielded back, I think. That's a select Mr. Uh, Chairman, that is, that is absolutely that. inappropriate. I was just pointing out something that I think is so Mr. So Chairman, ridiculous. that is not appropriate. And we will go to Mr. Klein for five minutes. The gentleman from, George, or from Virginia excuse me, is recognized. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Durham, your, your report is not just sobering, as you stated. It's, it's outrageous and deeply troubling. Can you confirm these several main points that it, that it found. The FBI did not have an adequate basis on which to launch Crossfire Hurricane, correct? That's correct. The FBI failed to examine all available exculpatory evidence, correct? Correct. FBI leadership continued the investigation even when case agents were unable to verify the evidence, correct? That's correct. The FBI did not interview key witnesses in Crossfire Hurricane, correct? Correct. And individuals within the FBI abused their authority under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, correct? Correct. The FBI immediately opened Crossfire Hurricane as a full counterintelligence investigation. What other options could the FBI have taken rather than immediately opening such an investigation? Attorney General um, Edward Levy essentially created the guidelines in this area, these three divisions of assessments, preliminary and then full, although they were different names at the time, that has evolved over time and become more particular. In this instance, um, the information that they had received from Papadopoulos about a suggestion of a suggestion, and not anything about emails, but just the suggestion of a suggestion, was sufficient um, and would have been, uh, would have required the FBI to take a look at, well, what is this about? You open it as an assessment, and then you would analytically go try to collect intelligence that either supports or refutes or explains that information. That's the whole purpose of it. You assess it, and then you can move to a preliminary investigation. And if the evidence bears it out, then you go to a full investigation where you have all the uh, tools available, including the most intrusive uh, physical surveillance and electronic surveillance of U.S. citizens. And here, they just immediately went to open it as a full investigation without ever having talked to the Australians or gathered other evidence. Right, so investigators relied on misstatements by the confidential human source, ignored exculpatory statements made by Papadopoulos in submitting the FISA application to surveil Carter Page, correct? That's correct. Is it true that an FBI employee fabricated this evidence? Can you expand on that, that fabrication and, and the reliance to support that uh, this sure. application. In, in connection with the one of the extensions, the final extension or renewal of the FISA on Carter Page, one of the agents who had come on board wanted to be certain that there was information that uh, there was their information as to whether or not Carter Page had been a source of information to the CIA and pressed uh, Kevin Kleinsmith in the um, general counsel's office of the FBI on that point. <clears throat> 
Kleinsmith got a hold of people at another government agency, intelligence agency, on the issue, and that person indicated, not indicated, said that yes, in the FBI parlance, uh, Carter Page was the source, and put that in writing. <clears throat> when Kleinsmith talked to the agent who was saying, we want to be sure on this, is, was he or was he not a source, Kleinsmith said, no, he said he's not. He said, did we get that in writing? Kleinsmith said, yes, and they said, well, I want to see it. And then Kleinsmith altered the other government agency document to reflect this, to say that Page was not a source, when he, in fact, was a source. That's the gist of it. What did the investigators mean when they said they hoped the returns on the Carter Page FISA application would, quote, self-corroborate? <clears throat> that is another uh, troublesome uh, thing. Maybe agent was they're saying, well, if we can get on um, um, surveillance, electronic surveillance of Page, then we'll find out essentially whether we really do have probable cause or not. I mean, it would self-corroborate in that sense. Are investigators supposed to corroborate information before or after it's included in a FISA application? Yeah. Um, you have to have that before you intrude in the liberties of American citizens. In fact, the FBI is required to follow its Woods procedures, uh, which the FBI adopted to ensure the accuracy of the information contained in FISA applications, correct? That's correct. And did, Fisk, did the FISC ever criticize the FBI's handling of the Page FISA application? Yes. And what were some of those concerns that they raised? Well, ultimately, uh, the FISC uh, issued um, an order, a memorandum, indicating that um, uh, had the information that was uh, disclosed in the investigation uh, done by Inspector General Horowitz, did a very thorough job uh, and a good job and a well-written report. Had they known that, at least uh, the uh, second and third renewal applications uh, would not have established probable cause. And I think the Bureau, uh, I'm sorry, the, um, uh, the Department of Justice acknowledges that as well. If the FISC had all of the information that uh, I think is included in this report, I think it's highly doubtful that there would have ever been an application submitted, and if it was submitted, that the FISC would have ever granted that order. Thank you. I yield back. Yields back. The gentleman from Tennessee is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Durham, you were appointed by whom? Um, so I was, uh, Who recommended you and appointed you? As the special counsel? No, as the U.S. attorney. As U.S. attorney. Um, it was President Trump at the time, with two Democratic senators from Connecticut supporting the nomination. Mr. Trump appointed you. Do you believe Mr. Trump has pretty good judgment on people, their abilities, and their character? I'm not going to characterize um, Mr. Trump or my thoughts about Mr. Trump. Mr. Barr appointed you special counsel, is that correct? That's correct. Mr. Trump has called Mr. Barr a gutless pig, a coward, and a rhino. Which of those is correct, which isn't? In my experience, none of those are correct. So Mr. Trump isn't that good of an expert on character and judging people. In your opinion, he isn't, because he's, he's none of those. He's not a gutless pig, but Trump says he is. Yeah. That's outside the scope of my report. Uh, also outside the scope of your report, apparently. <laughs> also outside of the scope of your report or your, was, was apparently the meeting at Trump Tower between the Russians and the Trump boys, where they talked about allegedly adoptions, but we know it was really about sanctions. How was that outside of your report? Yeah, I'm not, I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite follow that. Meeting at the Trump Tower, attorney, uh, Russian attorney came to the Trump and Donald Trump Jr. was just wonderful, wonderful, we love it, we love it. Uh, Russian decisions to interact with the Trump campaign and influence the actions of the campaign, allegedly for adoption law, but really for sanctions relief. The FBI came up with that, did they not? I'm, um, a meeting took place at Trump Towers on June 9th. The lure, as I understand it, was that there was um, information, derogatory information on Clinton that was going to be provided. They met, and as I believe in a Hipsey report, the Hipsey report fully laid that out, that the discussion then at Trump Towers was about adoption, not about anything relating to Mrs. Clinton. It's totally, it was totally about sanctions. You're trying to get rid of the Magnitsky law. Adoptions is a ruse. Should you not have gone and looked into that and seen what the Russians were wanting in return for that? Because that's the biggest thing Putin wanted at the time, was to get Trump to relieve his people of Magnitsky sanctions. 
I think that um, uh, Director Mueller investigated that, and I believe one of your House committees um, explored that. That was outside the scope of what we were looking at. And, and, it's, and it was outside the scope of your authority to look at Kalimnikov, Kalim, Kalimnik and, and Manafort meeting and exchanging polling data? Was that out? I'm sorry, I'm not following you. Manafort. Question. You remember Manafort, the crook that managed the campaign for nothing but got tons of money from, the, from different Russian people over the years that y'all yeah. pardoned? That your, Mr. Barr later got, helped him with the commutation or a pardon, I think a pardon. Manafort. I know who Ms. Manafort is. Yeah. He met with Kalimnik and they discussed polling data. You don't know about that? I know that Mr. Klimnik met with a lot of people, including people. He in met the State with Department. Manafort and discussed polling data. Do you not know about that? I'm aware of that. All right. Why did you then th not think it was a good idea for you to look into it and see if the FBI wasn't correct in that there was collusion, a connection between Russia and the Trump campaign to elect Trump? My assignment was to look at the conduct of the intelligence community agencies, uh, not to conduct a separate investigation that was done by. House or that's done by the Senate or was done by Director Mueller. You don't think that if there was if the intelligence communities, the FBI, and others came up with this information and did good work, that that should be part of your balanced report? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not following your question. I apologize. Well, if I've it's a tried question. to follow your report. Mr. Donald Trump Jr. would have called it a, a nothing burger. Mm -hmm. You got no convictions. You got nothing. It was all set up to hurt the Mueller report, which was correct and was redacted, to hurt the Bidens and to help Trump. And you were a part of it. You have a good reputation. You had a good reputation. That's why the two Democrats supported you. But the longer you hold on to Mr. Barr and this report that Mr. Barr gave you as special counsel, your reputation will be damaged. As everybody's reputation who gets involved with Donald Trump is damaged, he's damaged goods, there's no good dealing with him because you will end up on the bottom of a pyre. I yield back the balance of my time. Sure. My, we uh, presume the gentleman's undecided on, on how he feels about the pre former president. <laughs> Gentlemen, witness can respond. Yeah, my uh, concern about my reputation is with uh, the people who I respect and my family and my Lord. And I'm perfectly comfortable with my reputation with them, sir. Well said. God bless you. Um, the, um, the, 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 the chair recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, uh, Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Durham, uh, thank you for being here today. On October 3rd, 2016, the FBI met with Christopher Steele, who confessed to relying heavily on a Russian national living in Washington, D.C. as a subsource. That subsource was later identified as Igor Danchenko. Uh, Steele not only used Danchenko to create the dossier, but according to your report, Steele was unable to corroborate any of the substantive allegations made in the dossier. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, even after the FBI offered Steele a million dollars if somehow he could actually follow through and, and underscore some of those uh, specific items. Is that correct? That's correct. So the FBI interviewed Danchenko and Steele subsource, the Steele subsource, for three days, from January 24th through January 26th of 17. However, according to your report, Danchenko could not provide any evidence corroborating allegations contained in the dossier. Is that correct? That's a fact. And yet the FBI paid Danchenko $220,000 during his time as a confidential human source. Is that correct? That's correct. And did the FBI propose making continued future payments to Danchenko, totaling more than $300,000? That's correct. Danchenko becomes a confidential human source that enlists his own subsource, Charles Dolan, as was brought up earlier, who was a Democrat operative and had previously served as an advisor to Hillary Clinton's 2008 presidential campaign. Is that, is that your understanding? Is that correct? That's correct. Did Danchenko ever disclose his relationship with Charles Dolan to the FBI that you're aware of? He did not during the um, interviews that were conducted in January. Subsequently, he was specifically asked um, in an interview um, with his then handler, do you know Charles Dolan? 
you listen to the recording, he hesitates for some awkward period of time and says, yes, I know who Dolan is. So he acknowledged knowing uh, Mr. Dolan. Do you think it had anything to do with he was simply worried that disclosing a Democrat operative as a subsource might jeopardize the whole uh, payroll deal that the FBI had set up with them? And we lay these facts out um, as we do other facts in the report and leave it to others to draw the reasonable conclusions or inferences from those facts. Very good. Of, a hundred, of the hundreds of individuals who the FBI interviewed through the course of Crossfire Hurricane and Miller's special counsel investigation, um, this came up earlier, was Charles Dolan ever interviewed by the FBI? He was not. Do you have any insight as to why the FBI would not interview him or overlook such a high profile person in this whole investigation? <clears throat> That's something of a mystery. Going back to October 3rd, um, according to the um, ALAT, the Assistant Legal Attaché for the Bureau, um, uh, when he first, oh, I'm sorry, going back to July 5th, when he first met with Steele, um, Steele had indicated uh, to uh, him uh, at the time that HC was aware of uh, what he, Steele, was doing. When the Bureau went back to interview uh, Steele on October 3rd um, about matters relating to Crossfire Hurricane, uh, Steele, in fact, had provided the Bureau uh, with Dolan's name as somebody who might have information relating to Trump, but he was never interviewed. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not, I don't know why they never uh, interviewed um, Trump. Uh, I'm sorry, why they did not interview Mr. Uh, Mr. Dolan, but they didn't. Um, the explanation that was given to the um, intelligence analyst who's referred to in the report essentially was that that would be outside the scope of um, their mission, outside the, their role. Very good. Uh, you note in your report on page 168 that one of the analysts of the Miller team was told, quote, to cease all research and analysis related to Dolan, unquote. This was the same analyst who, according to your footnote, uh, prepared a timeline in the event she were later interviewed about her role on the Miller Special Counsel investigation. Is that correct? That's correct. Igor Donchenko had also relied on other subsources, namely, namely Olga Galkina and Sergey Millen. When the FBI interviewed those two subsources, were either of them able to verify the information in the Steele dossier? Well, speaking first to um, Millian, um, we interviewed uh, Millian as well. He's outside the country. He um, claims to fear for his safety and, and whatnot, but he adamantly denied ever talking to Denchenko or providing uh, any information um, uh, akin to what was in the Steele reporting. Um, in fact, he was a, a supporter of President Trump, which made it seem highly unlikely that he would be providing derogatory information to somebody he had never met or spoken to. Uh, so that's as, as to uh, Milian. With respect to Ms. Uh, uh, Galkina, uh, Ms. Galkina was somebody um, who provided some information to Danchenko, provided some information to Dolan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm out of time. Gentleman, gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Special Counsel Durham, in March of 2019, before releasing the Mueller report to the public, Attorney General Barr released a statement mischaracterizing its findings and conclusions. And shortly thereafter, Attorney General Barr announced that he was investigating the FBI for investigating Putin's interference in the 2016 presidential election. And then in April or May of 2019, Attorney General Barr appointed you to lead that investigation. Isn't that correct? He did appoint me to lead the investigation, yes, sir. And then in October of 2020, uh, uh, Attorney General Barr appointed you as uh, an independent special counsel so that you could continue investigating the origins of the Russia, Russia, Russia investigation once Trump was out of office, correct? I was, I was appointed uh, special counsel in October, yes. And by that time, your investigation had already cost the American taxpayers over six and a half million dollars, isn't that correct? Um, at that point, probably not, no. Well, at this point, how much has it cost? 
as I understand the figure, having looked at it, it's around six and a half million dollars. Um, and, and after three and a half years of investigation and six and a half million dollars of taxpayer money spent, your investigation led to the indictment of only three individuals, correct? That's correct. Well, it's and contrary, of, and contrary of to the fervent prayers of some on this panel, uh, former FBI Director Jim Comey and former CIA Director John Brennan were not among those three who were indicted. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And to the extreme disappointment of some on this panel, your investigation failed to produce indictments against Hillary Clinton, correct? That's correct. Didn't indict Barack Obama. That's correct. Didn't in indict Joe Biden. That's correct. Couldn't even indict Hunter Biden. We didn't correct? investigate Mr. Hunter Biden. And of your three prosecutions, one ended with a guilty plea to an unrelated, uh, 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 unrelated to the origins of the FBI investigation, and that individual received a probated sentence with no jail time, correct? Parts of that are correct. And the other two men you prosecuted went to trial on the charges, uh, charging, they, they were accused of lying to the FBI, and both were slam dunk acquitted, isn't that correct? They were acquitted. And none of the individuals you prosecuted were ever charged with being part of a hoax or a fraud or a witch hunt or a politically motivated deep state conspiracy against Donald Trump, isn't that correct? I would not say that that's accurate. You mean you did charge somebody with being a part of a hoax? We charged Mr. Sussman with having knowingly provided false information to the FBI regarding Alpha Bank. But he, lying was, he was acquitted, though, right? After well, that wasn't your question. He, well, he was, Mr. Sussman was acquitted after you charged him, correct? Grand jury found He was probably. found innocent by a jury of, uh, by a unanimous jury of 12. That's not true. Well... What's true is the grand jury found probable cause to indict uh, Mr. Uh, Sussman. A jury of a his peers ju acquitted him, though, correct? And a trial you're jury... Not, you're not going to disagree on that, are you, uh, Mr. Durham? I'm going to try to answer your question as well. Well, let me ask you this, because in your report, you uh, related or alluded to allegations of misconduct against Mr. Sussman and Mr. Danchenko as if those allegations had been proven have been proven true at trial when, in fact, both those individuals had been acquitted and your allegations disproven. Do you believe that it's ethical to state something as a fact in an official government report when the court system found that you could not prove those allegations? Well, I think if you read the report, you'd see that we talked about the results of the trial and we included all of the evidence that we had available unfortunately not all of which was admitted at trial. Well, well let me ask you this, Mr. Durham. You closed your investigation after you failed to find that the FBI investigation into Putin's interference in the 2016 election was politically motivated and was a deep state conspiracy against ex-President Trump. You were unable to prove that that was true. That, so is, you, we, that is not what I was investigating. Well, but you did not find that that was true, correct? You found it to be false, as a matter of fact. If you, if, um, you've had Isn't that correct? You have a chance to read the report. Well, the I did. Mr. Fact. Chairman, can we, the time has expired. Didn't could you, the gentleman be allowed to answer the question? The gentleman can did, respond. Time the gentleman from Georgia has expired. The witness can respond. He's saying if you, if you read the report, we lay the facts out in the report as to these matters. I'm not here to talk about Mr. Trump. I'm not here to talk about... Um, deep state or whatever other um, characterizations you made. This report is factual. Nobody's raised any issues as to whether it's factually inaccurate uh, in any way. People can draw their own conclusions based on those facts. Yep. Mr. Drum, you've been at it an hour and a half here. We can keep going. If you can keep going, uh, just let us know when, if and when you meet. Yeah, you, I'm uh, fine. Whatever okay, the great. committee wants. Chair, now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa. Mr. Durham, uh, each of us on the panel has a different background and a different uh, idea of what's best to get out of this report and the work that you have done so faithfully, not just for the last four years, but for your entire career. So I'm going to start off by asking, uh, uh, is it true that you have uh, the Attorney General's Exceptional Service Award, uh, a decoration for your service? That's true. 
Is it also true that you uh, have the uh, Attorney General's Distinguished Service Award? That's true. And uh, who awarded you that? You know, it goes back in time. Attorney General Reno uh, had... No, no, 2012. Oh, I'm sorry, in 2012. I'm trying to remember what award it was. I, I don't frankly recall. I don't oh, really just just that. for the record, it's Eric Holder. Yeah. Um, that, was, that was the CIA investigation. That's right. It's uh, Attorney General Holder. Correct. It was. And uh, you, uh, you had to deal with some of the most despicable people and, and, and do the things that we do sometimes when wrong has been done. Uh, so I want to thank you for that. It seems like for your entire career, you've been a go-to for difficult situations, uh, uh, not necessarily the standard, I, I'm trying to rise quickly award, but in fact, you're a career investigator. And uh, I would imagine pretty closely that you've got your 82% overall. But I want to talk about something that I'm not qualified to talk about, but I can ask you. Are there what you would call unindicted co-conspirators in this? In other words, are there people at all levels who did things wrong, who were not charged with crimes because of the limitation of the ability to bring charges against them for what they did, even if it was wrong? We brought charges where we thought in good faith that we could prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt. Is okay. there, is there but, evidence but, beyond that? Of course. Sure. So in your experience as a career prosecutor, when, when people break the rules and it changes the outcome of something, like launching an investigation without a predicate, like uh, the president, the vice president, the attorney general, and a host of others, FBI director, knowing that this had been started with a false predicate, knowing that Hillary Clinton's campaign with her approval, in fact, had authorized this, not op research, but this weaponizing of a false claim. When they did that, they in fact changed the outcome, whether criminal or not, of many things, including certainly some things in voters' minds. Isn't that correct? I mean, generally speaking, there are lots of bad things that people do that aren't crimes. Um, we can only charge those that are crimes. And I appreciate that. So when people are constantly making this point that somehow you didn't put enough people in jail, you gave us 300 pages that give us a responsibility. And uh, as I said, I, I'm not going to try to pretend that I'm the smart lawyer up here at all, or even a lawyer. But I am somebody that understands organization, oversight, and transparency. In your report, you, uh, you do note the changes made and so on. But unless we make changes in transparency to outside individuals who can be counted on to be ombudsmen to the process, isn't it true that if the president, the vice president, the attorney general, and a host of other top people at the FBI and Department of Justice choose in the future to push to make, cha to make outcomes occur that would not occur according to their own printed rules, that no rule per se is going to change that? I think that's true. As we say in the report, ultimately what this comes down to is the integrity of the people who are doing the job. Are they adhering to their oath or are they not adhering to their oath? Are they following the law or are they not following the law? Well, in my 20 plus years uh, on this side of the dais, what I've found is that people, when the light of day is shed on them, follow the rules much better than they aren't. So for all of us up here, I want to thank you for your contributions and your service. Hopefully, I know you're going into, you've gone into retirement, but hopefully in the future, as we begin looking at reforms that can be counted on and believed by the American people, at reforms that create better transparency, at reforms that do not allow FISA judges to be misled by people with an agenda, that you'll be available to at least give us some of the uh, guidance from your decades of knowing how it's done right at the Department of Justice. And Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for your indulgence and so many people. I will not take excess time. I believe this witness's 300 plus pages speaks extremely well for itself, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Durham, uh, just so people remember what this is all about, let me ask you, the Mueller investigation revealed that Russia interfered in the 2016 election in sweeping and systemic fashion, correct? That's correct. And Russia did so through a social media campaign that favored Donald Trump and disparaged Hillary Clinton, correct? As the report says, yes. And Mueller found that a Russian intelligence service hacked computers associated with the Clinton campaign 
and then release the stolen documents publicly? Is that right? That report speaks for itself as well. Mueller also reported that though he could not establish the crime of conspiracy beyond a reasonable doubt, he also said, quote, a statement that the investigation did not establish certain facts does not mean there was no evidence of those facts. That also appears in the report, doesn't it? It's the language to that effect, yes. In fact, you cited that very statement in your own report, did you not, as a way of distinguishing between proof beyond a reasonable doubt and evidence that falls short of proof beyond a reasonable doubt? Correct. As an illustration of this, both Mueller and congressional investigations found that Trump's campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, was secretly meeting with an operative linked to Russian intelligence named Konstantin Kalimnik, correct? That's my understanding, yes. And that Manafort, while chairman of the Trump campaign, gave that Russian intelligence operative the campaign's internal polling data, correct? That's what I've read in the news, yes. And that Manafort provided this information to Russian intelligence while Russian intelligence was engaged in that social media campaign and the release of stolen documents to help the Trump campaign, correct? You may be getting beyond the uh, depth of my knowledge, but it's... Well, let me, let me right. say very simply, while Manafort, the campaign chairman for Donald Trump, was giving this Russian intelligence officer internal campaign polling data, Russian intelligence was helping the Trump campaign, weren't they? I, I, don't, I don't know that. You I really don't, don't know right. those very basic facts of the investigation? I know the general um, facts, yes. Do I know that particular fact myself? No. I mean, I know that I've read that in the media. And are you aware, uh, Mr. Durham, that Mueller and congressional investigations also revealed that Don Jr. was informed that a Russian official was offering the Trump campaign, quote, very high level and sensitive information, unquote, that would be incriminating if Hillary Clinton was part of, quote, Russia and its government support of Mr. Trump? Are you aware of that? Sure, people get phone calls all the time from uh, individuals who claim to have information like that. Really, the son of a presidential candidate gets calls all the time from a foreign government offering dirt on their opponent? Is that what you're saying? I don't think this is unique in your experience. Uh, so you, uh, you have other instances of the Russian government offering dirt on uh, a presidential candidate to the presidential candidate's son. Is that what you're saying? Would you repeat the question? Uh, you said that it's not uncommon to get offers of help from a hostile foreign government and a presidential campaign directed at the president's son. You really stand by that, Mr. Durham? I'm saying that, it, that people can make phone calls um, making uh, claims uh, all the time that you may have experienced. Are you really trying to diminish the significance of what happened here and the secret meeting that the president's set, son set up in Trump Tower to receive that incriminating Information you're trying to diminish the significance of that, Mr. Turner? I'm not trying to diminish it at all, but I think the more complete story is that they met and it was a ruse and they didn't talk about Mrs. Clinton. Uh, and, and you think it's insignificant that he had a secret meeting with the Russian delegation for the purpose of getting dirt on Hillary Clinton, and the only disappointment to express that meeting was that the dirt they got wasn't better. You don't think that's significant? I don't think that that was a well-advised thing to do. Oh, no. oh, not, not well-advised. Right. Well, that's, that's the understatement of the year. So you think it's perfectly appropriate or, or maybe just ill-advised for a presidential campaign to secretly meet with a Russian delegation to get dirt on their opponent? You would merely say that's inadvisable? Yeah, if you're asking me what I do, it, I, don't, I hope I wouldn't do it. But it's, it was not illegal. Uh, it, was, it was stupid, foolish, ill-advised. Well, it, it is illegal to conspire to get incriminating opposition research from a hostile government that is of financial value to a campaign, wouldn't that violate campaign laws? I don't know. I don't know all those facts to be true. Well, your report, Mr. Durham, doesn't dispute anything Mueller found, did it? No, our, our object, our aim was not to dispute Director Mueller. I have the greatest regard, highest regard for Director Mueller. He's a patriot. The only distinguishment between his investigation and yours <coughs> is he refused to bring charges where he couldn't prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, and you did. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Colorado is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Durham, I want to, as a fellow alum of uh, DOJ, I want to thank you for your service, number one. And number two, welcome you to Congress. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to be here. <laughs> I, uh, 
I want to ask you some questions about uh, FISA and, and um, some of your uh, most recent experiences as the uh, special counsel and, and what your uh, specific advice would be, I guess. I, I am uh, concerned with the conclusions in your report, and I just want to, they've been mentioned several times here, but uh, in your opening statement you talk about lack of investigative discipline, a failure to take logical investigative steps, and bias. It appears to me that the lack of investigative discipline and the failure to take logical investigative steps are a result of bias. Is that fair? It's, I think that that's fair. When you look at what uh, is involved here, this is a presidential campaign. Um, it's not a run-of-the-mill uh, investigation. This is um, so highly sensitive. It could affect the outcome of um, a presidential election and the future of the nation. You would expect that the discipline that would have been followed would have been um, higher than ever. Um, and that didn't happen here. The sort of analytical rigor, the discipline and how we investigate criminal matters, that was just absent here in large measure. Fair, uh, fair to say that there was a rush to judgment? I'm sorry? Fair, fair to say that there was a rush to judgment? In other words, the judgment of uh, proceeding with the investigation before following proper procedure? It's been alluded to here, the information that they had received from the Australian diplomats, not Australian intelligence or law enforcement, about Australian diplomats, about something that was said at a bar. <clears throat> Within three days of that information having been received at FBI headquarters, the deputy director of the FBI, according to Mr. Strzok, told him to immediately open that, and it was opened as a full investigation on a weekend with Mr. Strzok, not only writing the opening electronic communication, the opening memo, but approving that memo as well. And, and this is the same Mr. Strzok uh, who we saw the uh, text message from that had a clear bias regarding President Trump. It's the same person, yes. And uh, how long did Director Comey serve in the FBI before he became director? And I, I'm not saying Department of Justice, I'm saying FBI. Right. To my knowledge, he, he was not um, in the FBI prior to becoming director. And he promoted the people, Andy McKay, Peter Strzok, others, to the position in headquarters and then dealt with them there. Is that fair? He would have certainly had a role in the advancement of people in the upper management of the uh, FBI, yes. Um, my concern is that the, the bias that has been demonstrated there, whether it has been um, uh, eradicated or dealt with um, could exist in any of these agencies. And these agencies have access to very sensitive information, information that we and Congress um, allow uh, for counterterrorism, counterintelligence activities, um, and it really goes around the Constitution because it, it does not deal with U.S. citizens. And I'm talking about the FISA uh, rules now. Uh, have you heard of backdoor searches? I've heard the term, yes, sir. And, and it refers to the ability of an agency to look at a U.S. citizen's communications because the communication was with a foreign individual and it was recorded because that foreign individual was being looked at. Is that fair? That's fair. And the, uh, if there was this bias in an agency like the FBI um, that, that, that we saw previously, um, and they wanted to go after a U.S. citizen, they could use that technique to go after that citizen. And my question to you is, how do we prevent that? How do we in Congress take a look at FISA, try to maintain the national security interests, but at the same time protect U.S. citizens from a rogue agency, a biased agency or agent, I shouldn't say agency and condemn everyone, but, but individuals in the agency, how do we protect American citizens from what could occur. And, I, and let me give you another quick example. Uh, going out and buying information from uh, private data uh, sellers to, to obtain information that you couldn't obtain uh, with a search warrant because you don't have probable cause. Those techniques are all available under FISA. W what should we do? You know, that's clearly beyond my, um, uh, my background and, and experience. These are very complicated uh, questions, particularly when we know the adversaries are doing the same thing. And, you know, what, what do we do under those circumstances? So I think you've got a very tough job in figuring out how, you, how do you balance the liberties of the American people and protect the liberties of the American people while at the same time protecting um, the country and, uh, and the nation and the people of the United States. 
Um, I don't feel qualified really to provide you with any um, helpful information along those lines, but I know that it is a serious issue. It's a serious concern. I thank you and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, before going to the gentleman from California, the gentleman lady from Texas has a unanimous consent, I think? Yes, I okay. Mr. Chairman, uh, I ask unanimous consent to submit records from the Department of Justice reflecting meetings with the U.S. Attorney John Durham. These records were in response to American Oversight's request for DOJ communications between the offices of the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General and the Durham or his first assistant. I ask unanimous consent to place this in the record of this hearing. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. The Chairman, I have a unanimous consent. Gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, you and your colleagues have continually cited to Steve uh, DeUnio's uh, transcribed interviews using selected statements taken out of context. I move for unanimous consent to enter the entire transcript into the record so the American public can see for itself exactly what he said. Yeah, we will work on that. Yeah, we'll work on that. We don't want to, we got to, we'll talk with the chairman. We, we want to make that fully available. Mr. Chairman, you're objecting to a unanimous consent request then to some. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I object. Okay. <laughs> so if I understand correctly, Mr. Chairman, you're happy to cite selected portions of the transcript we're, out of context, we'll, we'll but you're not happy to Mr. see. Mr. Chairman, there's an objection. Is there further action? You don't want the American public to see this, Mr. Issa? Roll call vote, please. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's no vote a, there's, on that. There's, there, I, just want to, I just want to clarify for the gentleman. Uh, we want to put the transcript out. There's a couple. We've got a little work to do on certain names that have to be redacted for, for obvious reasons. But, um, yeah, we, want to, we, we definitely want to put the transcript out. Mr. We will work, we work with the minority to make sure that, that happens. I, want, I, want, I thought it was an amazing interview by Mr. D'Antuano, the former head of the Washington Field Office. We want that information out to the public, and we'll make sure it happens. Well, can I suggest, Mr. Chairman, that you grant the request subject to redactions to protect personally private information? So, without objection, so ordered. Thank you very much. Gentleman from California is... is and uh, you have accepted my submission. I didn't did hear... that right away. <laughs> right Thank you. away. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from California is recognized. Uh, Mr. Durham, uh, many of my MAGA colleagues want you to be someone who you are not and to say something that you clearly won't. And so I want to just start by thanking you for your many years of service to our country uh, as a federal prosecutor. I want to talk a little bit more about the independence of a special counsel uh, and just clarify, you did send multiple texts to the Attorney General after you were appointed a special counsel. Did you ever text message with Attorney General Garland once he took over as Attorney General? No, um, Attorney General Garland had me communicate through the principal uh, Deputy Attorney General, uh, Mr. Wein, uh, uh, Weinsheimer. Did you ever travel overseas with Attorney General Garland? Uh, no. And I met with, uh, with the Attorney General, but I didn't travel overseas with him. And President Biden, through the Attorney General, could have had you removed, fired. Is that right? Um, I'm sure he could have. And you stayed on? I uh, completed my term as special counsel. Was there anyone you wanted to indict that you were prohibited from indicting by Attorney General Garland? No. So if you wanted to, you could have indicted Hillary Clinton, but you never asked. Is that right? If I had the evidence, um, I, I, yeah, he could have, for sure. If you wanted to indict President Biden, you could have asked, right? Yeah, that was not part of our mission. We weren't uh, really looking at that. But. If you could have indicted Director Comey, you could have asked. Is that right? And you didn't. Yeah, the Attorney General, uh, Attorney General uh, Garland had never asked me not to indict somebody. Great. So I just want to make it clear to my colleagues, you had all the power in the world to indict anyone that you had evidence to indict, and you were never blocked from doing it. That's correct? That's correct. I also want to compare you to the last major special counsel investigation that we had. You agree Special Counsel Mueller charged dozens of individuals, and you indicted three. Is that correct? Indicted two, and another a third pleaded guilty. Right. And Special Counsel Mueller had dozens of convictions, some at trial, but no defendant was outright acquitted. Is that right in the Mueller investigation? Outright acquitted. Across the board, every charge acquitted. Right. I, I don't believe there are any acquittals. I'm not sure there were uh, dozens of convictions. There were dozens of, uh, there, yeah, more than a dozen people who were indicted. 
You were wise earlier to not weigh in on Donald Trump's character. You are under oath, after all. Um, but did anything in your report prove false that Russians met with Trump's family during the campaign at Trump Tower after an offer of dirt on Hillary Clinton? Anything prove that that meeting didn't happen? I don't have any evidence that that did not happen. Anything in your report prove false that in the 2016 campaign, Donald Trump tried and concealed from the public a real estate deal he was seeking in Moscow? I don't know anything about that. There's nothing in the report about it. It's not something we investigated. Anything in your report prove false that Donald Trump publicly asked Russia to hack Hillary's emails and then hours later they did? My if you're referring to... Um, did you prove, did, did Donald Trump not say at a press conference, Russia, if you're listening, you should get Hillary's emails? Did you prove that he didn't say that? Yeah, no, we didn't, okay. we didn't investigate Did that. you prove false in the 16 campaign that Trump's campaign manager gave polling data to a spy for a Russian intelligence service? We didn't investigate that. Anything in your report say that Donald Trump in 2016 acted the way that Americans would want a presidential candidate to act with regard to Russia? I'm sorry, could you repeat Are that? Are you signing off on the way Donald Trump acted with Russia in 2016? Yeah, our report uh, doesn't address that. And you agree that Russia interfered in the 2016 election? I agree that there's some um, substantial evidence to show that. Thank you. Mr. Durham, my MAGA colleagues want you to be someone you're not, and they want you to say something you won't. They want you to join the law firm of Insurrection LLC, which incidentally and probably appropriately is chaired by a guy who never passed the bar exam, and you're wise not to do that. You see, my colleagues today, they are making themselves footnotes and foot soldiers in the history books that will chronicle Donald Trump's corruption. And I yield my remaining time to Mr. Schiff. Mr. Durham, returning to your decision to uh, speak out during the pendency of your investigation, um, did you have staff on your team advise you against making statements during the pendency of your investigation? They didn't advise me either way, no. Did any of your staff raise ethical concerns about your speaking out either in an interim report uh, or after the Inspector General investigation? Did any of you, your staff raise ethical concerns with your doing so? Not that I recall, no. A yeah, raise a technical concern, no, not that I'm aware of. Did they raise concerns with your speaking out during the pendency of the investigation? Time of the gentleman has expired. The witness can respond. I'm sorry. Uh, um, Did any of your staff to... raise concerns about your speaking out during the pendency of your investigation in contrast to DOJ policy? Not that I recall. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Florida is recognized. Good morning, Mr. Durham. Can I just complete that answer, Warren? I, I, but I don't want to lay any blame at their part. I made that decision to make a statement. They, they were not involved in it. Nora Danahy. Right, Nora Danahy. From, gentle lady from Florida. Right. Nora Danahy, a friend of mine, a, um, a very good lawyer, an honest person. Why did she resign? That's Nora Danahy. That's why we brought her on. Why did she resign? The gentleman's time has expired. The, the, uh, the gentleman's answer can, the question if you'd like. Mr. Chairman, who's in charge here? Because it's not Mr. Schiff, I don't it's, think. It's, it's, it's uh, the lady's time from Florida. Good morning, Mr. Durham. Good morning. As a former federal prosecutor, I want to begin by telling you how much I appreciate your work, that of your team, and your presence here today. And you may begin by answering the prior question, if you wish. With respect to uh, Ms. Danny, I have the greatest respect for her. She's a friend of mine. She's very well educated. She's an honest person. We had some disagreements on issues, and I don't really have any comment uh, beyond that. I'm not going to discuss the internal management and decision-making. I'll, I'll tell you this, that every agent and every lawyer who worked on this project had a full voice in the decisions that were going forward. I made the final decisions. Thank you, Mr. Durham. I'd like to focus on the Department of Justice's procedures as to FISA applications when that process is conducted appropriately. Uh, to begin with, so FISA surveillance application must include an affidavit from a federal law enforcement officer, correct? That's correct. And that affidavit must demonstrate cause to believe that the target of the surveillance is an agent of a foreign power. Is that also right? Right. They say if it relates to a U.S. citizen, it has to be that they're a knowing agent. If it's a non-U.S. person, a knowing element is not required. And it is intended that that affidavit should rely upon reasonable, trustworthy information, is it not? That's correct. Right. 
and in some cases, and including the case of Carter Page, those affidavits, that information can include the use of information obtained from a confidential human source, correct? That's correct. And when information from a confidential human source is included, uh, would you agree that it's important that material related to the reliability or trustworthiness of that confidential human source is disclosed within the affidavit? Yes. And I believe you testified here earlier today that in this case, information in that Carter Page application related to the reliability and credibility of the confidential human source was not included in these, in these applications. Is that right? I, think, I, I believe that's correct. Would you tell us, in your experience, in your many years working with the department, why is it important that that type of information is included and disclosed to both federal prosecutors and to the court? There's, uh, um, when, when matters are submitted uh, to the court, it's for a reason or to a judge. That's to let an independent judicial officer uh, weigh the question as to whether probable cause exists or not. In providing that information, to independent, objective judicial officers, judicial magistrates, if there's confidential human source information that's being provided, it's important for the person, the judge who's reviewing this, to know uh, what's the basis of the person's knowledge. Is it hearsay, or do they have personal knowledge, as an example? And then whether or not there's some track record or basis to believe that the information would be credible coming from this person. And of course, at this stage of the proceeding, the person who's the subject of the investigation has no idea that this application is even being made or considered or reviewed by the court in most cases. So That's it's correct. solely less with, rests with the government, the responsibility to ensure that this power, that this surveillance power that's being used is being done in a way that is appropriate and compliant with the law. That's correct. And you mentioned something earlier about that in this case, agents immediately moved to the most intrusive investigative means that were available, referring, of course, to the interception of live communications, correct? That's correct. In this instance, the Bureau almost immediately, when they opened it as full investigations, it was the umbrella case, um, Crossfire Hurricane, and then the four subfiles, they immediately uh, went to try to uh, get Pfizer coverage um, on Papadopoulos, which uh, they weren't able to do. Uh, and then uh, Carter Page. And some of the techniques for, for law enforcement, you know, there are a myriad of other things they can do to collect surveillance information short of this interception of communications, like uh, poll cameras, pen registers, trap and trace, trash poles, correct? There are many other things that in, in, in investigations are often utilized prior to taking this step of attempting to intercept live communications. Right. Those are typically building blocks uh, for electronic surveillance. So based on your testimony so far, what we're hearing is that here, a FISA application was pursued without disclosing some relevant information to prosecutors or the court, without following standard procedural rules, utilizing investigative techniques that, that uh, were the most intrusive without first exhausting other techniques and instead pursuing the most invasive method possible from the outside against Mr. Page. That's essentially correct, yes. Now, one other thing, you mentioned earlier during your testimony that the failures identified during your investigation, that if they were not addressed, they would result in national security risks and continued public lack of confidence in our institutions of justice, that there were no overnight fixes, but we needed accountability standards and consequences. Um, Would you elaborate, please? Time um, the gentleman has expired. The witness can respond. Yeah. The, the national security interests that, uh, here include uh, liberties um, uh, of the, uh, the American people. Uh, one of the things that was most disturbing about uh, the dossier, the Steele dossier, is whether or not this is, so at least some of it, was Russian disinformation. Whether Igor Denchenko, who personally wrote that he was responsible for 80 percent of the intelligence in the, um, in the dossier and 50 percent of the analysis, whether or not Mr. Denchenko was the source of uh, Russian disinformation. Um, if you don't run some of those things to ground, it does affect the liberties or potentially affects the liberties of the American people and the national security interests of this country. Thank you, sir. General Lee yields back. The gentleman from California is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Before I begin my questioning, I want to say that the House Judiciary Committee is responsible for helping to ensure the rule of law. The chairman of this committee ignored a bipartisan congressional subpoena. The president sent by this chairman has damaged the ability of congressional committees to get information from witnesses and damaged the rule of law. Now, Mr. Durham, thank you for being here voluntarily today. In your report, not only did the FBI have information, as stated before, that the Australians knew that Trump foreign policy advisor George Papadopoulos had suggested that the Russians were going to release anonymous information damaging Hillary Clinton. The FBI also knew and had information that the Democratic National Committee was hacked by the Russians and information was being released to the American public. The FBI also had information from various media reports that Trump had relations with different Russian businessmen and the FBI had information that Trump said, quote, Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. The FBI had all that information prior to opening Operation Hurricane, correct? Crossfire Hurricane, is that right? That's correct. Okay. If the FBI had chosen to do so, the multiple pieces of information they had would have allowed them to open a preliminary investigation. Is that right? In our report, we say that the FBI certainly uh, had an obligation to uh, assess the information, you know, perhaps make it a preliminary investigation. That's okay. Our In fact, it would have been a dereliction of duty for the FBI to have just sat on their hands and done nothing with the information that they had. Is that right? Yeah. The FBI should not have ignored that information. Okay. It's also true, isn't it, that the Inspector General of the Department of Justice looked at this situation and concluded that not only did the FBI have enough information to open a preliminary investigation, the FBI had enough information to open a full investigation. That was the conclusion of the Inspector General, correct? My recollection is that the uh, Inspector General said it's a low bar and he thought that it had been met. Um, the Inspector General didn't necessarily address um, well, and, so uh, thank you. I'd like to enter the Inspector General's report dated December 2019 into the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. Okay. Turns out the FBI was correct. The Department of Justice found that the Russians interfered in our elections in a, quote, sweeping and systematic manner. A bipartisan U.S. Senate report confirmed that the Russians interfered in the 2016 elections and that that interference benefited Donald Trump. Paul Manafort, Trump's former campaign chairman, also publicly admitted to giving internal Trump campaign data to the Russians, and the U.S. Treasury Department found that this data, which it said was, quote, sensitive information on polling campaign strategy, was then passed to Russian intelligence services. There is a phrase to describe the facts I just set forth. It's called Russian collusion. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter both the Treasury Department uh, documents dated April 2021, as well as the Bipartisan Senate Report Intelligence dated August 2020. Without objection. Okay. Now, Mr. Term Durham, I'd like to ask you the following simple yes or no questions. Trump's former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, was convicted, correct? I'm sorry, could you just repeat yeah, that? One? Trump's former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, was convicted, correct? That's correct. Not Trump's former foreign with policy powers. advisor to the campaign, George Papadopoulos, was convicted, correct? Correct. Trump's former deputy campaign manager, Rick Gates, was convicted, correct? Not in connection with the okay. Russian Trump's. Matter. All right. Mr. Durham, you can hold yourself out as an objective Department of Justice official or as a partisan hack. And the more that you try to spin the facts and not answer my questions, you sound like the latter. So I'm just going to ask this simply. Trump's former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, was convicted, correct? That's correct. Trump's longtime advisor, Roger Stone, was convicted, correct? I'm sorry, missed the last Trump's thing Trump's longtime advisor, Roger Stone, was convicted, correct? Correct. In contrast to multiple Trump associates who were convicted, you brought two cases to jury trial based on this investigation, and you lost both. And so I don't actually know what we're doing here, because the author of the Durham report concedes that the FBI had enough information to investigate, 
And thank goodness the FBI did because multiple Trump associates who committed crimes were held accountable. And the best way to summarize what happened is thank you to the brave men and women of the FBI for doing their jobs. I yield back. Gentlemen's time's expired. He yields back. Gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock, is recognized for five minutes. First of all, Mr. Durham, I apologize for the personal attacks that have been leveled upon you by uh, uh, from sources on the other side of the aisle. This is what they do. This is how they argue. So we've gotten used to it, and I hope you will, too, at some point. The central charge in the Russian collusion hoax was that um, Trump campaign operatives were in contact with Russian intelligence sources. Were Clinton campaign operatives in contact with Russian intelligence sources? Uh, that's beyond the scope of our report. Um, I can only speak to the former, and the former is there was uh, no such evidence. Um, as we report in, in the report, there was a... Well, was, there were, was, was, Danchenko, was Danchenko a Russian intelligence source? Um, Mr. Denchenko had been investigated uh, by the FBI um, for espionage. They closed the case when they mistakenly thought he had left the country. Um, Mr. Denchenko's um, status in connection with that espionage matter was never resolved uh, by the Bureau. The Bureau, in fact, never uh, opened it. And he was the source for, for much of the Steele dossier. He said that he was responsible for 80% of the intelligence in the dossier. And, and who, commissioned, analysis. who commissioned the Steele dossier? Um, the Steele dossier was done by uh, Fusion GPS, who was hired by Perkins Coie, who represented the Clinton um, campaign. And so so what, what role did the Clinton campaign play in this hoax? What, I'm sorry, did they what, play? What, what role did the Clinton campaign play in this hoax? Um, the Clinton campaign... Um, um, funded the work, the opposition research that was done by Fusion GPS, and GPS um, uh, paid Mr. Steele uh, for the uh, dossier. And, and who in the Clinton campaign uh, approved that relationship? Um, well, we uh, lay some of that out uh, in, the, in the report. I think it was um, uh, Mr. Elias, who was general counsel uh, to the campaign, who um, engage the services of G uh, Fusion GPS. Mr. Jordan referenced the Clinton plan intelligence. Uh, exactly what was the Clinton plan? Um, based on declassified documents in the, in the public record, there was intelligence information <clears throat> that um, was received uh, at virtually the same time that the information came from, um, from the Australians, I mean, within a day or two. Uh, that intelligence in, included uh, information that there was a uh, purported plan um, designed by um, one of Mrs. Clinton's foreign policy advisors uh, to create a scandal tying Donald Trump uh, to the Russians. That's the essence of the uh, intelligence as contained in the uh, declassified uh, information. Did the president receive this intelligence? Um, on August 3rd of 2016, uh, then Director Brennan had uh, briefed the President, Vice President, um, Director of National Intelligence, the FBI, the Attorney General, and others. When you say the FBI, you mean Mr. Comey? Um, he had, on August 3rd, it was um, conducted at the White House, so it was Director Comey himself. So Mr. Comey knew about this, President Obama knew about this, Vice President Biden knew about this. Um, but um, it wasn't provided to the agents uh, uh, on the case or, or provided to the secret uh, FISA court. Is that correct? That's correct. Why wasn't it? No, we can tell you what the facts are. Um, and people can draw their own conclusions from that. Uh, about the Papadopoulos comments at the bar that were used as justification uh, for, for this whole thing, what would the FBI have learned had it looked into this information honestly? If before opening Crossfire Hurricane, they had checked their own files and communicated with other intelligence agencies um, and the like, they would have found that there was nothing at that time in their files um, that would corroborate the information, the suggestion of a suggestion and that the Russians might provide some kind of assistance. There's nothing in their files that would corroborate that. Uh, the Steele dossier was entered in the congressional record. Was it true? The, I'm sorry, the Steele dossier, the Steele dossier was, it, was entered into our congressional record. Was it true? 
there is not a single substantive piece of information in the dossier that has ever been corroborated by the FBI or, to my knowledge, anyone else. You mentioned that the FISA court uh, criticized the misleading and, and false information that was used to request the FISA warrants, but did the FISA court hold anyone in contempt for that? Uh, not to my knowledge. Did they apply any sanctions to anyone responsible for that? Um, not to my knowledge. They did, did they even knowledge. yell at anybody? They, they issued an appropriately harsh uh, memo um, talking about what the expectation is um, when a document is submitted to that court, that it be uh, truthful and accurate and complete. Um, and that was the expectation, is the expectation. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognize the gentlelady from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Durham, thank you for being here today to speak with us about the report you produced looking at the FBI's investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election. Mm -hmm. Uh, your report took four years and over six and a half million dollars in taxpayer dollars to produce. Mr. Durham, how many cases did you bring to trial during your time investigating the 2016 election? I'm sorry, we just missed part of that. because How many was, cases was did you bring to trial? Two. Two. And in how many of those two cases did the juries vote to convict? Neither one. Neither one. Um, neither jury voted to convict the gentleman that you prosecuted, and in fact, in one case, the trial judge threw out one of your charges because the claim that you were charging as false was, as he put it, literally true. Mr. Durham, I think you were given an impossible task by Attorney General B Bill Barr. He asked you to figure out how to make Donald Trump's Spygate claims true, but you couldn't do that because you quickly realized that the claims were false. And so you set about, as many Republicans on cable news do, trying to find a way to blame Hillary Clinton for Donald Trump's woes. Mr. Durham, do you know how many people Special Counsel Mueller indicted or obtained guilty pleas from? He, he, they uh, indicted a charged number of people, I think. It was 34, it was 34 people and three companies. Um, do you know how many of those indictments have, uh, 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 were of individuals who were acquitted in court? I don't know that anybody was acquitted. That's right. The answer is none. So I think the difference between your investigation and Mr. Mueller's was that Mr. Mueller actually found actual evidence of a crime. We know that Russia did attempt to interfere in the 2016 election. We know that Russia did hack into the DNC email server. And Mr. Mueller's prosecutions reflected that reality, such as the case of 12 Russian military intelligence officers who he charged with crimes related to the hacking and the leaking of leading Democrats' emails in 2016. Similarly, Mr. Mueller found repeated instances of Trump campaign associates lying when asked about their interactions with Russian interests. And a result, as a result of Mr. Mueller's investigation, George Papadopoulos pleaded guilty in October of 2017 to making false statements to the FBI. Trump campaign aide Rick Gates pleaded guilty to one false statements charge and one conspiracy charge. Trump national security advisor Michael Flynn pleaded guilty to making false statements to the FBI. And in November of 2019, Trump advisor Roger Stone was convicted on seven counts, including lying to the House Intelligence Committee and tampering with a witness. Again, Mr. Mueller indicted or got guilty pleas from 34 people and three companies. Mr. Durham, you're a career prosecutor, correct? That's correct. And you started working as a state prosecutor in 1977, and you joined the Justice Department in 1982. Yes or no, prosecutors prioritize bringing cases to court that have a high likelihood of winning? I would not say that that's the um, standard, no. So you don't think that to call an investigation successful, you should at least reveal some new information. Most of your report, Mr. Durham, is a rehashing of old news, including process-related concerns that the FBI had already addressed. In fact, that's why you said you were not recommending or recommending any further charge, changes to FBI policies or procedures. So at the very least, I would think that you would need to win some of the cases on their merits. But that's not what happened, and that's not what mega Republicans are looking for. Um, Chairman Jordan seems to be looking for any excuse to discredit law enforcement and DOJ who are finally holding Donald Trump accountable for his serious violations of the law. Violations, by the way, that Donald Trump just admitted to last night 
on Fox News. Americans will see through this facade, and I wanted to ask Mr. Schiff if he wants my additional 40 seconds of time. If so, I yield. I thank you. I just want to follow up uh, on my question before. Uh, Nora Danahy is a very well-respected member of your team. Why did she resign? I'm, I'm sorry? Nora Danahy was a very well-respected member of your team. Why did she resign? Yeah, that's not part of the report, and I'm not going to discuss internal uh, matters. Management did she resign over disagreement she had with you about how you're handling the investigation? It's not part of the report. I'm not going to discuss it. it it's I not part of the report, but, regard you, for Ms. But, you, but you know the answer, Mr. Durham. Why won't you tell us? I think because that's not part of the report. That's not part of the mission, and I'm not going to discuss internal discussions. I can tell you this, that with respect to uh, every major decision that was made um, by our team, every agent and every lawyer had full voice in expressing their opinions, and we proceeded accordingly with me making the final Some voted with their feet to leave your office. The time of the gentleman's gentlelady has expired. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Durham. That's not part of the report, it is a lot of what I've heard from my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. Uh, one of my colleagues from California said, I don't know what we're doing here. And what we're doing here is going through this very damning report. Um, the FBI has failed uh, many times over the, over the years that you investigated them. I'd like to ask, did the FBI open Crossfire Hurricane without speaking to the people who provided the information? Yes. Did the FBI open Crossfire Hurricane on a Sunday, only three days after reviewing the information? Yes. Did the FBI open Crossfire Hurricane without any significant review of its own intelligence database? Yes. Did the FBI open Crossfire Hurricane without interviewing the essential witnesses? Yes. Did the FBI open Crossfire Hurricane without using any of the standard analytical tools typically employed in evaluating intelligence? Yes. Did the FBI consider the possibility that it was the target? Um, it, it didn't appear so to me from the, from the evidence. And so I'm curious if you could tell me, because I'm not a prosecutor, some of my colleagues here are, but the average American is not. Can you tell us why and under what motivation would a prosecutorial agency act in such a way where it willfully ignores multiple instances of ex exculpatory evidence throughout the course of its investigation? Because I just don't understand that. That, in my experience, that, that, is, um, that is not the norm. That's not how the FBI uh, performs. In this particular case, as is reflected in the, uh, in the report, there appear to be people, uh, persons in the FBI who were central to opening the investigation that had um, rather strong views concerning um, then-candidate Trump. And we've heard in your report that you, you reference confirmation bias. And a lot of times, or sometimes, we see that um, the investigators uh, perhaps the FBI investigators, they have a confirmation bias uh, because they want a guilty outcome. They want to find the suspect guilty. But we did not see that to be the case for Hillary Clinton. So it makes me think that based on the investigation into the conduct and the continuous disregard for duty, there was obviously a special motivation to find this suspect, Donald Trump and his campaign, guilty above anyone else. Would you agree? I can, I can speak to what the facts show. Um, as documented in the report, um, again, uh, people draw their uh, reasonable inferences, conclusions from those facts with an honest reading of the report. If either you or someone on your team willfully ignored exculpatory, exculpatory evidence, refused to interview key witnesses, favored one suspect over another, or did any or all of the things that the FBI did during Crossfire Hurricane, would you face repercussions? There ought to be repercussions. If that ever happened in connection with an agent that I was working with and I knew about it, the first thing would be to report it to the court, um, and the uh, probably second thing would be to report it to their superiors. Uh, the third thing would be sure that that agent never worked with me again. I appreciate that. I also appreciate uh, your remarks earlier in your open testimony where you said, my colleagues and I carried out our work in good faith, with integrity, in the spirit of following the facts wherever they lead, without fear or favor. I believe you did that. I'm, uh, I'm disappointed in some of my colleagues uh, that have said uh, disparaging remarks about you. I've seen very few that actually talk about your report. They want to talk about everything else, which tells me you're onto something. I'd also yield the balance of my time to the chairman. I appreciate the gentleman for, for yielding. So Dan Chinko is the primary subsource. A few years before, he does this work. He was investigated by the FBI for espionage. Is that right, Mr. Durham? Correct. 
And that, that case was halted because the FBI thought he'd left the country, right? Correct. Had he left the country? No. Where was he living? He, were, he remained living in the place that he was living when they opened the investigation. Right here in D.C., right? <laughs> yeah. He hadn't left anywhere. He's right here in, in D.C., and they, we're going to stop this. And then they go hire him, use the tax money of the people I get the privilege of representing to pay this guy, who they obviously knew was a Russian spy. They hire him who's the source of all the false information. Is that true? They paid him, um, uh, they hired him, uh, and they paid him. A um, couple hundred thousand, if I, if I recall, right? It was over $200,000. Yeah, and then this guy is hanging out with Dolan, Charles Dolan, who's a buddy of the Clintons, who's also a source for the false dossier that was used to spy on an American citizen. He's hanging out with Dolan. In fact, don't they meet on a park bench somewhere in Arlington, Virginia, on New Year's Day? New Year's Day, middle of the day. I mean, this is straight out of the movies, right? And the FBI says, but we're not going to talk to Charles Dolan. I mean, this is two of the dumbest things I've ever heard of. <laughs> they won't talk. To, they, they, they pay a guy who's a Russian spy who's the source of the dossier. The other source of the dossier is Charles Dolan, who meets with that guy on a park bench in Arlington, and they don't want to interview him. I mean, you can't make this stuff up, but that's what Comey's FBI did. And they're still doing this kind of baloney because Mr. D'Antuano told us so, running operations, running investigations out of headquarters instead of assigning a U.S. attorney, a job you did for a long time and did very well. That is a huge problem. And your report, that's why your report's valuable. Gentlemen, uh, I yield back to the gentleman who was out of time, and we now recognize the gentleman from, oh, Mr. Cray. Oh, we got, oh, I'm sorry, right here. The gentlelady from Pennsylvania is recognized for five. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you for coming to testify today. I know it's not a comfortable experience, obviously. Um, and clearly the questions have exposed that uh, we have many areas of disagreement across the aisle, but I am relieved that we have no disagreement about one of the fundamental conclusions of your report, that it was incumbent upon the FBI to uh, open some form of investigation when presented with evidence that a presidential candidate and his associates are either coordinating campaign efforts with a hostile, na hostile nation or being manipulated by such a hostile nation. And, and that is a fundamental conclusion, right? Some form of investigation was necessary. Right. I mean, the FBI, when they receive information, disinformation, other information, they uh, almost always have some obligation to assess that information. Sure. That's what the assessment is about. Sure. So. We've established over the course of questions that the current Attorney General, Merrick Garland, allowed you to run your investigation, I think you said, independently and without interference, right? That's correct. Okay. And you've talked about the thoroughness of in your investigation as you performed it over the course of four, four and a half years, uh, $6.5 million, hundreds of, of FBI agents, 6 million pages of documents, not yeah. hundreds of FBI agents hundreds of personnel working with you. Um, so that you would not be accurate, but. Okay. Well, you also had the benefit of prior investigations, including the Mueller report. Correct. Um, the 2019 Department of Justice Office of Inspector General's report, which concurred with you that there was an obligation to investigate, right? Yes. Although it disagreed with you about precisely the form, correct? I think it's more than form, but you know, we had disagreement in that regard. And there was also a 2020 select Senate Select Committee report on intelligence run by Senator Rubio that affirmed that Russia, in fact, had sought to interfere in our elections to benefit the Trump campaign, correct? That the report, I don't remember if Senator Rubio was the chair at the time or not. Okay, but I don't there think was. he was. Okay. So with all of that, you and Attorney General Barr had both been appointed by President Trump, right? I'm sorry, can you just repeat that one again? You and Attorney General Barr had both been appointed to serve at that time by President Trump, correct? I had been nominated by um, President Trump, and I believe that uh, Mr. Barr was uh, nominated to be Attorney General by Mr. Trump. Okay. And the AG Barr appointed you to be special counsel, right? He appointed me as special counsel, yes. Okay. But in contrast to the independence and lack of interference, which you have noted on multiple occasions that has been uh, performed by Merrick Garland, A.G. Barr had a very active role in your investigation. And I just wanted to mention a couple instances. 
First of all, shortly after your appointment, you and A.G. Barr both traveled overseas and met with Italian officials who provided some allegations with respect to criminal activity by the former president, correct? We traveled to, um, to well, this is outside the reports. So I'm not sure that I'm authorized to talk about it, but we, were, we went to um, uh, Italy to try to pursue leads involving a particular um, um, mysterious professor. Okay. So you don't mention in your report those allegations of misconduct concerning the former president, correct? I'm, it's not I'm, in your report. You, limit, you didn't include that information in your report, right? Okay. What, which information? About your trip to Italy with A.G. Barr? No, I don't okay. know why I would have included and that the in a report. Day, the day the Inspector General's report was published, you issued a press release saying that you didn't agree with some of his conclusions. Um, did A.G. Barr ask you to issue that, re that uh, press release? Absolutely not. Okay, who did? I made that decision. Do you want to know why or no? Uh, actually, I wanted to know first, can you identify any other occasion which a special counsel has released a press statement questioning another special counsel or inspector general's report? Can you name one? Yeah, instance? I don't know of any. Okay. They may have, but I don't know about it. Okay, so did you communicate with A.G. Barr about your press, re press statement before his was released the same day, or was that just a fantastic coincidence? Did I communicate with Attorney General Barr about what? About your press release questioning the IG's report. I told Attorney General Barr, I didn't ask his permission, I told him that I was going to do it. Okay. One more question. There's been mention of the resignation of one of your colleagues, Nora Danahy, in the fall of 2020. Isn't it true that she resigned in protest concerning pressure by AG Barr for you to deliver an interim report or other results before the 2020 presidential election? You'd have to ask uh, Ms. Danahy that uh, I'm not going to discuss the internal discussions um, in our group. Or we could Google it. Thank you. I yield back. This is a pretty good source of information. Sure is. Uh, the gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Oregon is recognized. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Durham, for being here today and, and for your patience uh, with us. Uh, I, I want to talk about that space between uh, law and, uh, and, and policy, I guess, if you will. And I want to go back to, I think I, I got your words written down during your opening statement where you said there were troubling violations of law and policy. Do, do I have that right? Yes, sir. And so uh, your, the, the assertion has been that perhaps there should have been more indictments, more people uh, brought before the court for, the, for their actions. But uh, it appears to me that you, you tried that and, and perhaps encountered, uh, I, I haven't got, looked at your two, the two trials, that turned out not to reach convictions. But was it a situation where there was something wrong, but it didn't rise to the level of a crime? Is that what was going on in that space? You conduct these investigations. We conducted this investigation, done other public corruption investigations, organized crime um, investigations. And uh, when there's sufficient evidence that you believe that the evidence is sufficient uh, to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt, um, that case should be brought. There may be uh, evidence that you have, but you're not confident that it would be sufficient to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt and sustain that case on appeal, and you don't bring the action. And here, there's, uh, there was conduct, some of which uh, was misconduct. Um, there's conduct that um, was probably criminal, but you couldn't prove it. And that's, that's true here. It appears in um, other instances as well. Right, and I think the phrase political bias or confirmation bias has been used a number of times. Is that a crime? Um, confirmation uh, bias is not a crime. It's part of our human condition, I suppose. Yes, and it's, it's, uh, so you may well have found, and it sounds like you did, uh, troubling violations of law and policy, which perhaps would, would not lead to and, and did not, of course, uh, convictions, but it doesn't make it any less wrong when we have our uh, law enforcement agencies engaging in this kind of conduct. And I think that's what, why you call it troubling. Do I have that right? You have that right. And the, 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 I, the question, I suppose, is what can we do about this uh, situation looking forward? If it's not a crime, uh, but we know it's wrong, what, what should we be doing? And I think you made some suggestions. Can you recite those for us? And what You spent four years in this space, and there's obviously things going wrong that we can't convict people for, or at least it doesn't rise to the level that will warrant that approach. What should we be doing? Yeah, I mean, the, um, the real difficulty, in my view, is trying to figure out 
um, how to hold people accountable uh, for their conduct. Um, and it's, it's not a simple problem to solve. In the context of the FISA uh, situation, you know, for, for example, or um, maybe it would be the case in any instance in which there's um, what's referred to in the Bureau as a uh, sensitive investigative matter, a SIM, that there are additional rules that, that apply there. You know, maybe there's, it, it's come time where uh, if an agent is going to sign uh, a FISA application in a sensitive investigative matter, that they not only understand that they're signing under the penalties of perjury, um, but if the Bureau determines that they intentionally misstated anything, that their employment will be terminated. I mean, this is this real teeth in when somebody signs an affidavit, swears to something before a judicial officer, there are consequences if the, that is untrue. There are criminal penalties, but there uh, sure as heck ought to be other penalties as well. I mean, there are things like that. In these sensitive cases, I mean, this is not a normal case. This is a presidential election and it affected, it affected the nation. Maybe they ought to instill uh, practice, uh, for example, of red teaming, which we tried uh, to do uh, to an extent in our investigation, which is you have a group of people who take the opposite side to make the arguments to try to point out either where the weaknesses are um, or where additional evidence to meet, needs uh, to be uh, developed. Um, it may be that the benefit that the Bureau would benefit, as I said in the report, from having something of an ombudsman who would look at FISA uh, applications or look at the investigative effort under, uh, being undertaken in these uh, uh, sensitive investigative matters, um, who looks at how the investigation is progressing and whether or not, in that person's estimation, uh, the investigation is being done independently and in a disciplined way. Um, there are those kinds of things. But ultimately, I don't know how you hold people um, responsible absent the, their integrity and that kind of overview or review of what the, um, what the investigation is doing. Thank you, Mr. Durham. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman uh, from Colorado is recognized. I thank the chairman. Uh, Mr. Durham, thank you for testifying today. Thank you for your service it's to been a our, real pleasure. our country. <laughs> well, we appreciate your service to our country, to the Department of Justice. Uh, I've read your report, as I suspect most of the members of the committee have, and um, appreciated your work. I want to talk a bit about your interactions with Maine Justice, with the Department of Justice in particular, with Attorney General Garland. Did Attorney General Garland permit your inquiry to proceed independently? Yes. Did Attorney General Garland interfere with your inquiry, your investigation in any way? No. Did Attorney General Garland attempt to prevent or stop you or your team from taking any investigative step that you deemed necessary? He did not. Did Attorney General Garland provide support to your efforts? Um, in terms of um, occasionally we would need some additional personnel. Uh, in a couple of instances, we had a person that was detailed uh, from Maine Justice. Yes, so in that, in that respect, yes. Did Attorney General Garland decline to implement any of the recommendations that you've made? Um, I, don't, I don't know that. The letter, the report, I believe it's on page three uh, of your report, you say, and I'll quote, after the inauguration of President Biden, Attorney General Garland met with the Office of the Special Counsel. The office very much appreciates the support consistent with his testimony, referring to Attorney General Garland, during his confirmation hearings that the Attorney General has provided to our efforts and the Department's willingness to allow us to operate independently, end quote. And you stand by that, I suspect. I do. Correct. Sounds like the Department of Justice and the Attorney General were supportive of your efforts, did not interfere in any way with uh, the work that you did over the course of the last several years. There are some folks here in Congress, some colleagues of mine on the other side of the aisle, who have uh, talked about or indicated their desire to defund the Department of Justice. Do you believe the Department of Justice should be defunded? I don't believe these um, uh, discussions about defunding the police make any sense at all for the security of the nation, and I don't think defunding um, cornerstone law enforcement uh, entities um, make a whole lot of sense. Maybe more oversight, but defunding in our cities and streets and so forth, no, that doesn't make sense to me. But I've only been at this for 40 years. Sure. Well, and as I said, I, I, I am grateful to your service, and, for your service, rather, and 
I guess I just want to put a finer point on it because I, don't, I guess I didn't hear that in your answer. You said a cornerstone of law enforcement. I take that, you mean the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice obviously should not be defunded, right? You've, you've give, committed your career to the Department of Justice. You were a former U.S. attorney, a former acting U.S. attorney, 35 years as an assistant U.S. attorney. You have a decorated record of service to the department. I, I, I'm hoping you're willing to say on the record clearly that you don't believe the department should be defunded. I don't believe the Department of Justice or the FBI should be defunded. I think there may be, ought to be some changes and, and, and the like, but defunded, no. Thank you, um, and I appreciate your candor, and I agree with you. And, and, uh, with respect to the Office of the Special Counsel, of course, you've concluded your service. As you know, there are uh, different special counsels that are appointed from time to time. You've served in that capacity multiple times yourselves. There is discussion of defunding special counsels. Do you support more broadly uh, the principle of, of defunding the office of the special counsel? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would have to know, uh, know the particulars of what the discussion is, but I mean, the, the general notion that you had um, established special counsel office, and the special counsel is doing an investigation, that you're going to defund it would not make sense to me. Yeah, I, I agree. And just to put a finer point on this, you served as special counsel for a period of years. During the course of your investigation, for the bulk of that time, Democrats were in control of the United States House of Representatives. Uh, there was no effort that I'm aware of uh, to defund your office. And I, I assume that you would have construed that if someone had made an effort to defund the office of special counsel, your office, as you were under taking your investigation as political interference to the extent that that was being done to try to impair or impinge on your investigation. Is that an accurate statement? Yeah, I mean, if it were, if it were uh, our office, our team, I guess I'd have to know the basis of that to see if I thought it was, you know, political or, the, you know. Yeah, let's, we say were, it's, we're, let's say it's because people did too much money. Sure, let's say it's because people disagreed with the work that you were doing. They didn't like your investigation. They, they disagreed fundamentally with decisions you were making. I presume you would construe that as political interference. Uh, special counsels should operate um, independently. That's the whole purpose of uh, special counsel, so. I, I certainly agree, and again, I thank you for yeah. being here. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman, gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Alabama is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Durham, I appreciate you being here today. Sobering, I think, is a pretty good word. I think that's a good description of what we're talking about. When I read your report and as we talk about it, when I'm in the district, very often one of the major concerns is a weaponization of investigations and the Department of Justice against certain people in our society. And so, um, yes or no, did the FBI place significant reliance on information given to them by President Trump's political opponents? I'm sorry, can you just repeat that one? Did the FBI... Did they place significant reliance on information given to them by President Trump's opponents? The Crossfire uh, Hurricane investigation, um, well, the, 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 the FISA in particular, the FISA and Carter Page, um, the Bureau had concluded itself, absent the uh, dossier, they wouldn't have um, been able to establish probable cause. It was, did, did the dossier come from President Trump's political opponents? It was funded by uh, the Clinton campaign um, and, the, and the DNC. Um, uh, so in that, that degree, yes, it came, that's how it was paid for. Can you connect the dots between the Trump, I mean, I'm sorry, between the Clinton campaign and the investigation of the FBI? Yeah, um, you know, we, we were investigating, uh, did investigate, you know, what was, what was behind that investigation? How did it get started? Was it properly predicated as a full uh, investigation by the FBI? And why did it then continue even after Director Mueller had found a lack of um, sufficient evidence concerning conspiracy or collusion? Mr. Durham, is that, is that what you call sobering? Would that be sobering to you? But sobering uh, to me in connection with this investigation is the FBI, the people who were involved in the Crossfire Hurricane investigation, ignoring exculpatory information, uh, discarding information that was inconsistent with the investigative uh, narrative, with using information, in this instance from the Steele dossier, to establish probable cause to electronically surveil a United States citizen who happened to be a, uh, a Naval Academy graduate. Those things uh, are, are sobering, sobering to me. Oh, I would agree with that. Um, did the FBI ever fail to take or delay taking action in an investigation involving Hillary Clinton? 
Um, I didn't, that wasn't, um, well, there's a portion of the report that re, uh, re, uh, relates to the disparate treatment. So did the FBI um, a delay? There are three instances that are identified in the report where the FBI's investigative efforts uh, were considered considerably more disciplined um, than was the case uh, with respect to Mr. Mr. Trump. More discipline, you mean, bias? And, and let me move on, Mr. Durham. I don't want to run out of time. Did the FBI give the Clinton campaign a defensive briefing? Um, they gave, in a particular manner, the FBI gave um, Mrs. Clinton's represent, legal represent, uh, representatives uh, a debriefing of a defensive nature, yes. Why wasn't the same done for the Trump campaign and President Trump? We um, explored that during the course of the investigation. The, um, what we learned is set out um, in the report. It would appear from at least what we were told that very little uh, thought went into whether uh, they should give um, anybody in the Trump campaign a defensive briefing, and they didn't do A lot it. of thought went into giving Hillary Clinton's campaign a defensive briefing, apparently, but not President Trump. In uh, one instance, uh, the, I think you're referring to um, – the submission of a FISA application in that matter against the foreign interest was premised on them giving a defensive briefing to Mrs. Clinton and some other uh, political... Mr. Durham, is it safe to say that the Clinton campaign colluded with the Russians to accuse Donald Trump of colluding with the Russians? I could not phrase it that way. I, I could say is that the uh, Clinton um, uh, campaign uh, funded the information that showed up in the, in the dossier. Uh, the Clinton uh, uh, campaign uh, funded the um, information that was put together uh, concerning an alleged secret communications channel between Trump and uh, Alpha Bank, um, uh, which was presented to the FBI through uh, Mr. Sussman. So, yeah, there are those things that uh, definitely occurred, and the evidence establishes that. Thank you, Mr. Durham. I appreciate your service. I yield back to the chairman. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Durham, Carter Page is an American citizen who... Naval Academy grad, served our country. Um, why not just talk to him before you spy on him? In this instance, I mean, I think, I don't know if people looked at this in the report. Um, there was a particular piece of information that had been given to Michael um, Isikoff and appeared in a Yahoo News article mm -hmm. on September 23rd, in which Mr. Isikoff lays out what he's obviously been told, and it's clearly the information um, from Steele. But it also included um, a statement that a senior law enforcement official confirmed that um, uh, Carter Page was on the radar screen. That matter was never referred for investigation as to who leaked that. This is an investigation that's supposed to be clo uh, closely held, mm -hmm. uh, confidential, uh, sensitive investigative matter, and that's never referred to, nobody ever looked at. Who's the senior law enforcement officer who gave the information to Michael Isikoff that Carter Page uh, was on their radar screen. That's not number, uh, number one. Who do you one. think it was? Mr. Chairman, the time is well expired. The witness could answer the question. You can't answer another, ask another one. I appreciate the ranking member for pointing that, that fact out. Okay, I'm not sure am I supposed to answer or not. I'm, am I done? You're I'll done. let you answer. Oh, um, okay. So then with respect to, um, uh, to uh, Carter Page, uh, Carter Page, within two days of that article, wrote a letter to Director Comey saying, um, I, didn't, I didn't do the things that are suggested. I didn't meet with these people. I'm willing to sit down and talk to the FBI. You know, tell me when and where, essentially. He offered to be interviewed. The gentlelady from Texas is recognized for unanimous consent. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me uh, submit into the record an article dated 618.23, after years of political hype, the Durham inquiry failed to deliver. As unanimous consent, and then ask unanimous Objection. consent to place into the record this language from a letter directed to uh, Mr. Durham on May 15, 2023. The Federal Bureau of Investigation appreciates the special counsel's independent review. We also appreciate your acknowledgement of the extensive cooperation the FBI provided to your team throughout the review, including production of nearly 7 million pages of documents, assignment of full time FBI special agents to assist in your fact finding process and provision of FBI technical Not expertise. objection. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The gentlelady from Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Special Counsel Durham, for being here today. Uh, as has been noted, it's been four years and six and a half million dollars 
uh, of an investigation of an investigation. And the Durham report makes no new recommendations to change FBI policy or procedure. It does not conclude that the Crossfire Hurricane investigation should not have been opened. And it even acknowledges that the Clinton campaign did nothing worthy of prosecution. Sadly, the Durham report dredges up allegations from unsuccessful prosecutions, including claims that have been rejected by judge and jury. The flaws of the Durham process were so troubling that some aides resigned in protest. I did Google and, in fact, read the news articles around the resignation of Nora Donahue. Uh, that uh, it is reported that she resigned for, because of pressure on, the, on you and, and the, the uh, special counsel group uh, to produce a report or an interim report prior to the presidential election. You can't comment on Nora Dennehy's uh, personnel matter. Were you ever encouraged, persuaded, uh, pressured to issue an interim or report prior to the presidential election? And see, without hesitation, I was not pressured into doing anything. Was it suggested to you? It was not suggested to me. And yet it might have been suggested to someone who worked under you, separate from you. I don't believe so. Okay. Mr. Durham, would it have been a dereliction of duty if the FBI sat on its hands and did not investigate with the information they had in front of them? Isn't it I mean, true? I'm, I'm sure the, the Bureau has an obligation to investigate. Uh, they should investigate um, information that they receive from the public or, or otherwise. And generally speaking, yeah, they have an obligation to look at and, and in, assess information. And in this case, they had an affirmative duty to investigate. Would you they agree? Had a, they had an affirmative duty to assess the information they had gotten from the Australian Which diplomats. would be an investigation. Uh, you were assigned to investigate that investigation. Mr. Durham, when did you first meet with Attorney General Barr about a potential investigation into the Mueller report, the Mueller investigation? You know, I was appointed in May of uh, 2019. I had met Attorney uh, General Barr after, uh, not in connection with these matters, but I think I initially met uh, the Attorney General uh, when I became the U.S. Attorney for Connecticut. Let me, so let me just oh. put the calendar together. Uh, it was on March 22nd that the Mueller report was submitted to Attorney General Barr. Would you agree with that? That's the, yeah, March 22nd. And correct. according to public records, you met with Attorney General Barr on March 25th, three days later. Okay. And on March 24th, Attorney General Barr released his so-called summary document of a 448-page uh, report, which blatantly mischaracterized the findings in the Mueller report. Would you agree with that? No. Did you discuss the Mueller report during your meeting with Mr. Barr on March 25th? I don't believe so. I think that I... I the timing the, was three days after he received the report, and you don't think in your meeting you talked about the Mueller report? I don't, I don't think that was was. I think it was when I was meeting the Attorney General because I had become the U.S. Attorney in Connecticut in it, mid maybe, to late February. Maybe you could, maybe you could search your memory right. and get back to us on that. It's troubling to me because it is clear you were brought in by Attorney General Barr the same week the Mueller report was released and the day after his misleading letter, which hung out there for 25 days before the public got our hands and our eyes on the redacted report. You were hired to investigate the investigators. One week after you met with Mr. Barr, on April 13th, Attorney General Barr's counselor, Seth DeCharm, emailed you offering assistance on behalf of Barr, saying, quote, John, the AG has made me aware of the redacted uh, material you're working with him on, and he asked me to provide you with my support and assistance. Is that true? I think that's correct. Okay. I don't remember the date, but that sounds right. And that's only April. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering if you weren't yet put into this, this, um, this field. Uh, Donald Trump was very vocal on Twitter, as he always has been, about his belief that the Mueller investigation should never have been taken. Are you aware of his tweets? I know that the uh, former president um, was a tweeter, yes. He was a tweeter. Some Republicans on this committee believed uh, that part of your purpose was to exonerate uh, Mr. Donald Trump. I want to take you back to your opening statement. It's at paragraph four. As you know, Mr. Durham, you said this morning, if repeated or left unaddressed, these issues could result in significant national security risks and further erode public faith in our justice system. We now sit with a former president indicted 37 counts of 
around the documents, the classified documents that he took, he held, he moved, he concealed, he lied about, he showed to other people, 37 counts. If repeated or left unaddressed, these issues could result in significant national security risks and further erode public faith in our justice system. I thank you for your service, for pointing out what really matters when we have a very dangerous former president and criminal indictments to come. I'm a mess of Mr. Trump's own time, making. I am baffled by this, this uh, committee's lifting up of a time corrupt the president. Has expired. And I thank you for indulging me just as you indulge yourself. Thank God, you. God bless you. That's right. God bless Equal you. Opportunity. Uh, the the, the um, Mr. Durham, uh, if you can, if you can go one more round. Do this every day. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is this is relatively calm to some some hearings, and we have Mr. If you can go one more, then we'll give you a break. But we'll we'll recognize the gentleman Everybody from California, and we'll give you a quick break, maybe five ten minutes, and we'll come back and and, and finish. Sure. But the gentleman from California is recognized for five. Uh, Mr. Durham, several people today, including Ranking Member uh, Madler and three representatives from California, uh, Mr. Schiff, Mr. S Mr. Swalwell, and Mr. Liu, uh, have attacked you. Mr. Ranking Member Nadler called your report a political exercise with eth ethical ambiguity. Uh, Mr. Liu uh, called you a partisan hack. However, it seems that the, they're taking issue not so much with the conclusions of your report as those of Mr. Mueller's report, uh, which concluded uh, that the investigation did not establish that members of the Trump campaign conspired or coordinated with the Russian government in its election interference activities. That conclusion directly contradicted statements made on the record by those representatives. For example, Mr. Schiff in 2017-2018 made statements such as, the Russians offered help, the campaign accepted help, the Russians gave help, and the president made full use of that help, and that is pretty damning. He also said, there's clear evidence on the issue of collusion. He said, I think there's plenty of evidence of conclusion, collusion or conspiracy in plain sight. Mr. Durham, the gentleman yield? are those statements supported by the conclusions of the Mueller the report? Yield? No. Mr. Uh, Durham, is, are those statements supported by the Mueller report? I don't believe so. Mr. Nadler stated, it's clear that the campaign concluded and there's a lot of evidence of that. The question is, was the president involved? Mr. Nadler also said there was obviously a lot of collusion. Uh, Mr. Durham, were those statements supported by the Mueller report? I don't believe they are supported by the Mueller report. Mr. Liu stated uh, in a press release in March of 2017, the bombshell revelation that U.S. officials have information that suggests Trump associates may have colluded, colluded with the Russians means we must pause the entire Trump agenda. We may have an illegitimate president of the United States currently occupying the White House. Uh, Mr. Durham, did the Mueller report establish that we had an illegitimate president occupying the White House? Not to my knowledge. Mr. Swalla stated in 2018, in our investigation, we saw strong evidence of collusion. Did the Mueller report support that there was strong evidence of collusion? Not to my knowledge. Even here today, we had uh, Mr. Schiff uh, raise questions about your public statement uh, during the investigation, saying this somehow violated a DOJ uh, policy. However, Mr. Mueller himself made a public statement uh, in January of 2019. This is a article from CNN headline, Mueller's office disputes BuzzFeed report that Trump directed Michael Cohen to lie to Congress. So whatever policy there might exist in the DOJ with respect to public statements by special counsels, it would seem that you and Mr. Mueller would be on equal footing with respect to it. Is that correct? It would seem so. Mr. Nadler, Ranking Member Nadler also suggested that we're only here today because of the recent indictments of President Trump. However, you received your assignment as special counsel in 2019. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, 2020, the special counsel was in uh, 2020. In 2020. And was that before or after the events alleged in the recent indictments by the president? By the president? That was before. And is it customary for a special counsel to come testify in Congress upon the issuance of the report? This is my first experience of this sort of thing. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I know that uh, Director Mueller had had occasion to testify before Congress, so I, I guess this is not unique. So it's pretty likely you would have been here whether or not the president had been recently indicted. Yes. Contrary to Ranking Member Napper's statement. I want to quote from you uh, a part of your report where you say, uh, there are reasons why in examining politically charged and high profile issues, the office must exercise and has exercised special care. One of those statements you said is that even when prosecutors believe that they can obtain a conviction, there are some instances in which it may not be advisable to expend government time and resources on a criminal prosecution, particularly where it could create the appearance, even if unfounded, that the government is seeking to criminalize the behavior of political opponents 
or punish the activities of a spe specific political party or campaign. Uh, could you just expound on that a little bit, this idea that there are prudential considerations that may counsel against prosecution, even if there has been some technical violation of a statute? Sure, the um, standard principles of federal prosecution include, kind of as a bedrock, that um, you ought not to bring a prosecution unless you believe in good faith that there's sufficient evidence to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt, and the jury will convict, um, and that the conviction, a conviction, can be sustained on appeal. There may be those instances in which you're pretty well convinced that a crime was committed in the can identify the person who committed it, but you can't in good faith say uh, a jury is likely to convict in this case. We believe that uh, a jury will convict and that we can uh, sustain it on appeal. Those are the principles that we tried to apply here, that we followed here. They're the same principles I've followed for 40 years as a federal prosecutor. What are you referring to when you, uh, when you say that there uh, might be additional considerations involving the perception that you're criminalizing the behavior of political opponents? Yeah, I mean, th these, are, these are difficult things. For example, uh, taking this case, uh, I think all the members of the committee have had access to whether they took advantage or not, I don't know, but uh, we filed a uh, classified appendix here, right? So there are some prosecutions where it may very well be that it looks like, and you think you can prove the cr crime beyond a reasonable doubt, but because of the classified nature of much of your evidence, it's never gonna see the light of day. So that might pre uh, preclude a prosecution. Um, you know, things, things of that sort uh, that come up that uh, are part of the prudential judgment that a prosecutor has to make um, in these matters. I yield back, thank you. The gentleman yields back, we'll take a short break, short recess. Uh, if we can come back in 10 minutes, so at 12.05, uh, we'll, we'll